Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome back for an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He is the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Uh, if you, in case you missed the news, uh, J- Justice League Snyder Cut uh, accidentally got put up on HBO Max for all of like five minutes the other day. Uh, I think we all know who's responsible for that. I tried... So hard to find it too. I literally, oh, I, did, I did too. I walked I right walked. on, turned on Tom and Jerry. Nothing. Yeah. No. So I think we all know who is responsible for that. Uh, it wasn't, you know, some IT person at HBO Max who accidentally hit the wrong button. Uh, I think it was Agatha all along. Quite possibly could be. Also joining us in studio, another co-host, the senior sports editor of the ODPH. He is your coach. He is my coach. He is the coach, Coach Duffy. He stole my line. I know oh. he did. Well played, Pat is just. Getting the one-liners in today. Yeah, yeah. I got nothing. He's got nothing for now, but as soon as we get done with the intro, we got a lot to talk about on this show. So definitely, we want to interact with you. Join in the conversation on social media. You can find all our accounts and so much more at OchoDuroParlayHour.com. We want you to join in on Facebook. Join in on Twitter. If you go to at ODParlayHour, you can find the personal accounts of Coach Duffy and Padawan J. Interact with them in between the shows. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on TikTok. T Public has a sale going on, so you definitely want to get that ODPA swag. So much is going on at OchoDuroParlayHour.com. You need to just go there right after listening to the podcast or during it. Either way, it helps out the show. It helps you out. So let us waste no more time and just jump right into this episode, shall we? Yeah. Let us kick off this edition of the ODPH recapping the finale of the TV show that took the world by storm. Mm -hmm. The multiverse by storm. Well played, Pat. Uh And that is WandaVision. So season or episode nine of season one just came out. A lot of mixed feelings about this. So we are going to be talking about the swan song of Wanda Maximoff and Vision for now. So I think it put to bed a little questions of are, is there going to be a season two are they going to keep going are they going to come back uh the episode is literally titled the series finale yes. so i think uh, yeah that puts the nail on that coffin you would think but with marvel we never say never true but anything could happen so we are going to be talking spoilers about episode nine the series finale so if you have not seen the episode pause this podcast right now watch it and join back in because we deep dive in it and we're going to start talking in three two one Pad, what did you think? I thought it was a good episode, all things considered. You know, tied up some of the threads in a nice little bow, gave us a little bit of holy shit, you know, what the heck is going on, you know, and then kind of left things off in a, in a way where I cannot wait for Doctor Strange 2 to come out and see these, you know, some of these plot lines go further. Coach, what do you think? Uh, my biggest takeaway was it really, really sucks that Doctor Strange had to get pushed back because yeah. I watched this and was like, Oh my God, I want more. I need to know more. You know, like it was just uh, literally with that, the bonus scene and the way things ended, I was like, Oh, and then to find, I didn't know the original game plan was strange in May. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I knew strange was coming out in 2022, but I didn't know the original plan was May until somebody posted it. And I was like, Oh, right. Oh yeah. What a per, like had it been that ending and then leading to May, what a way to, tie up a show oh absolutely but now we gotta wait a whole year and a half almost to, to get there it looks Bummer. that way right now but there is some light at the end of the tunnel as we were recording there are some news that los angeles uh, movie theaters are going to be opening possibly sure. in some capacity this weekend so if the movie theaters are going to start opening and obviously new york and la are the two big ones there is a chance that we're going to start getting back on schedule with our Marvel Universe cinematic releases. Yeah. So that being said, it looks like Doctor Strange might be coming out at its rescheduled time. But like with anything, we wait to see in the COVID era to see if this is going to actually happen. Oh, they might put it in May? Or they, aren't they still no, 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 yeah, no. I was going to say. No, no. A Black Widow is still coming out, but for yeah. where they're supposed to come out next year, oh, right, okay. right, it's, yeah, all, yeah. it's all still back on track. Like, yeah. like Black Widow will be the first one we see in theaters this year for the MCU. Right. And then I believe it goes Shang Chi, yep. Eternals, yep. Spider Man Three, right? Uh, uh, no Way Home, and then we go next year. So yeah. 
that is the current slate as is if everything holds up. But like we say, we're hearing some reports that there's possibility that are going to be opening up. So with that being said, it might be coming sooner than later. Because you never know with Marvel. They could juggle stuff sure. around. Yeah, well, obviously they showed that they can right now. I mean, And I wouldn't doubt that, honestly, with the success of this show. That I think that if they were going to rush this out, I don't know necessarily if they would do it before Spider-Man 3, but it's not out of the realm of thought. It just depends on how it works out. Just to jump in quick, I looked up the release schedule. You are right, uh, but the only thing uh, after Spider-Man No Way Home is Thor, Love, and Thunder. Then you get Doctor okay. Strange. I always, I always keep forgetting about that one's coming. But regardless of that, we do have a lot to enjoy about the buildup for the show. Yeah. Be, or build up for the movie because WandaVision closed out very strong. I did like the ending. I wasn't in love with it, but I did like it. Yeah, same. I, yeah. Did, I just, yeah. My, my takeaway was, man, I just wish that this movie was sooner. That's yeah. all. Oh, no, and there's nothing wrong with feeling that because where we jump in, the stakes have now been built up to that huge crescendo. We now have Agatha Harkness, played by Catherine Hahn, and is having that final standoff with Wanda Maximoff, played by Elizabeth Olsen. And the fate of the universe is literally going on yeah. right now. Which, well, the fate of Wanda's universe is. <laughs> but, you know, as we start deep diving into her power level, it really comes down to the universe. Right. To, if you really break it down. Because Agatha is trying to take Wanda's chaos magic and do what with it? I don't even think she knows. I just think that she wants the power. Yeah, she just yeah. wants to be the pow- the most powerful witch. That mm-hmm. was definitely in her M.O. Yeah. So as she's slowly but surely taking away Wanda's powers and you're seeing that great cgi when wanda's hitting her with magic wanda is decaying and she's getting drained herself yeah like you saw in the previous episode yeah which i thought was a really cool play that they did with the cgi for this episode too i mean i thought the entire series is that great cgi but this one really stood out and as we see that this fight is going on wanda's vision interferes yeah but then he is also greeted by an old friend asterix and that is the new vision, mm-hmm. which we know from the comics is the rebuilt vision after uh, he was dismantled. If you've read Avengers West Coast, you know what the story was going. It's going to be Vision Quest. And they now have their battle. Right. Which was awesome. Yeah, which it was, was awesome. great. I mean, it was big, high action, high octane as Wanda and her family, because the sons who were originally banished away from the battle are now coming back into fold. And are right. using their powers, which I thought that was very cool. Like, they just have that final standoff. We're going to protect our home, and it was the big rah-rah moment. I thought they played it off so well. Meanwhile, while the Visions are fighting, Agatha is increasing the stakes a bit. And she is showing Wanda what she's done with her powers. Right. And the damage she's done to the people of Westview. Yeah. Which, this is kind of like a weird, creepy scene a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, I definitely have my hair on the uh, end a little bit there. Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely something, because... Y- you know, she first undoes Dottie, mm-hmm. and, you know, Dottie just begs to be able to hold her 11-year-old daughter that she hasn't seen her in, you know, days or whatever, you know, it is. And she just, she can hear her crying, you know, but she can't do anything for her. So that was pretty, that was a tough scene. Yeah. I mean, but it was tough in the sense that it's like, you know, you know what Juan is doing, you know, because she's also pain struck too. But, like, the grief that she's causing the town, like, nobody really thought of the collateral damage till now, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it was a really interesting take about, like, okay, the ramifications of all the attacks and all the the events, rather, I should say, are all now coming to fold. And Wanda is now seeing firsthand of what she's done. And Agatha is using this this almost Mm Mephisto-like, which we'll get into a little bit later in the show, Uh that... She's just playing on her like, this is what happens, but if you give me your power, yeah, I can make this better. I can make this all go away. And she's also convincing her to break the portal down. Right. That is blocking Wanda's world, Westview, from the real 616. So it's a very cool, like, okay, we can try making things better, but at what cost? And during this cost, too, this is where we see uh, the Vision take a little break from his fight going on with the uh, new vision. Right. And he starts breaking apart to a la Avengers disassembled a little bit. Same thing with her sons. And it's kind of a a stakes moment. Are you willing to give up what you built? And it ultimately comes down that she opens the very barrier just a little bit, but she stops when she notices this going on. And I thought that was a very cool play that instantaneously she shuts the door on her world, but not before 
What's his face comes in? Haywood. Tom. Haywood, yep. Yep, he comes in with sword agents. So now that enters the fray. So that, there's a lot of moving parts going on with this, too. And another one that they touched upon, which I was surprised they skipped last episode, mm-hmm. but I was glad they touched upon it a little bit, was Monica Rambeau and fake Ralph. Pietro, Ralph, as yeah. we find out. My husband, Ralph. Yeah. Yeah, which Monica is playing this well, and she's really kind of figure out what's going on with Pietro. Bit of a letdown. It, I'm just going to say it. it. Not that I wasn't okay with it because it was uh, definitely a – uh, Marvel move, you know, a la uh, the Mandarin in Iron Man 3. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it was like, oh. Well, it, it is and it isn't. And what I mean by this is I, I fully agree. This was a bit of a letdown in the sense of we were expecting this to actually be Pietro. Right. But during their little interaction, she finds out that he is Ralph Boner. Yep. Now, my question about this was, okay, we do know that he is not the real Pietro. Right. But how is he still having super speed? The uh, necklace. Ne- uh, uh, Everything tied to the necklace? Yeah, it could be. And I think it was also whatever uh, Agatha did. Because you saw her, like, when he showed up, there was, a, you know, in, in the music video um, mm. explaining everything she did, when he showed up at the front door, there was that purple, you know, magic dust, I guess you could call it, coming off of him. Which at the time, we're all sitting there going, oh, if that's him from the X-Men universe, that's the magic of her bringing him in. Turns out that was the magic of her giving him the powers. And I can't remember if it was the the director of the show or a producer, but somebody said that the scene um, during Halloween, w- that was Agatha who was egging her along. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Because where I was kind of taken is, okay, was everything tied to that necklace that was around pretty much Pietro the entire time? When no, we didn't even notice it. That was one thing that I think right. just really kind of blended in. It was just, was that really his power source or what happened? Because we never saw anything after him once the necklace was removed. Right. And that's when when Loophole, I thought they left, that maybe they're going to touch upon later, maybe not, because now that Monica knows that that is just a regular uh, guy named Ralph Boner, right? that it's not the real Pietro. So there's a lot of like questions I had about this, though. Mm-hmm. Because, obviously, we all knew... That he was supposed to be Quicksilver. Right. People right. in that universe thought he was Quicksilver because Darcy said, oh, we recast Quicksilver. Right. So how would everybody know this just doing the eye test? Like, that was kind of a question I had about this. It just seemed like, okay, there was a lot of magic going on that maybe if they decide to bring Evan Peters back. Right. Which, as far as we know, he is not returning in anything. But as far as we know, yeah. As far as we know. But if they do, they do have a loophole, I think. No, the interesting thing that I saw was the the way that this could work and lead to um, to the X Men in the universe, mm-hmm. which was kind of an interesting thought because I think it was like Nerdist talked about it that you know you gotta think the with the three snaps and the amount of radiation is given off of the snaps uh-huh. that that could lead to the dormant status of the mutant gene coming mm-hmm. out, and I was like, damn, that's a good point because I mean. Think about what Monica went through going through the um, Wanda's uh, uh, the hex, hex field, yeah, yeah the hex field uh, and all that radiation that she took in, you know, almost waking up her dormant powers. Um, think about three snaps, you know, and what that could do. So I was like, that's a pretty good, pretty good point. There's a lot of different ways they can intro it, and I, 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 that's a really great point you bring up, Coach, because we know the mutants are coming. It's just a matter of when, not if. Mm-hmm. And if they want to write this into canon, this is an easy way to do it. And obviously, with the reaction that Quicksilver got, I already know there's a hashtag save Quicksilver out there. That <laughs> of course the, there is. Well, of course, the fans are get vocal enough. You know, you never know what could happen. I mean, look at hashtag save Daredevil. And now Charlie Cox, rumored, is going to be in the next Spider-Man. And then possibly anything after that is still kept under the Marvel hat for now. But there's a lot of chatter about it. Not so much for just from fans, but just from people that are really putting the scenarios together that you can fully see. So who knows what's going to be in the future for Evan Peters, but that writes off his story. But then as we're going back to the big battles, the Vision has been fighting with New Vision for quite a while. And I got to say, I applaud how this had that Superman-esque uh, feel to it when they're fighting in there. Yeah, you could, I can definitely see that. Yeah, they definitely had that feel. And then once they get to the standoff, Vision does a really uncanny move in his in his part. He tries using reason to talk oh, to him. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, he's the smart-thinking computer. 
Right, and he does do the mashup with him that he is able to convince Vision, hey, does this really seem like this is real? And just kind of just paraphrasing a little bit and explaining, like, how can I be you and you be me, but we're separate. Right. And I thought it was a very interesting way to set this up. And plus, he is smart enough to know that he's on borrowed time because he knows that when Wanda loses control of her powers, he can disappear. So when he touches Vision, New Vision's forehead where the mind gem should be, mm-hmm. he uploads himself into him. Yep. Yeah, definitely was that that was what was happening. I mean, or at least unlocking his those suppressed memories of what he was. Right. See, which I, I mean, Darcy telling him now is pivotal to what he was able to do. Because I mean, maybe had he have not known all the things that happened to him. From what Darcy said, he might not have known, you know, hey, you have blocked memories that need to be unlocked. Mm -hmm. And then the last moment we see him, he says, I am Vision. So now he is going to be an X Factor moving forward because we don't see him the rest of the episode. Right. That he has just disappeared. Their fight is done. And then we go back to Wanda still fighting with Agatha. Now, like I said, special effects in this were great. Agatha was pulling out every single stop she could. But it ultimately came down to where Wanda was saying, okay, I'm going to have you take my powers again to space or the air. And there's th- and she, Wanda's shooting bolts of magic against the hex, but she's missing. And we all thought, like, okay, maybe she's just unused, not used to doing this. But sure enough, she's setting up for a big play because once she gets into this, the air there, she tells Agatha, fine, you want to take my power. And Agatha starts absorbing it. And then when she tries reversing it and using it on Wanda, what happens, Pat? She can't. Yeah. That she can't can't do anything because Wanda took an old play that she had. She set up the markers to set up her spell. And completely did it. She turned Agatha's plan against her. And I thought this was pretty well set up. Oh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I thought, I mean, how clever and, and just goes to show uh, not only that the quote-unquote, you know, Scarlet Witch is the witch of all witches, but, you know, the fact that Wanda... Um, you know, has start to come to the realization of her powers and embracing them and, you know, just shows, I mean, she's an Avenger, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. they are quick witted and, and, and learn fast and it just shows the classic villainous bad guy, bad, you know, mistake of here's my plot. This is what I'm doing. And I'm essentially going to teach you the way to beat me. Yes. And Wanda was a very quick learner about this because even with Agatha trying to pull all the tricks that she could, even when. Uh, she lured her into the memories of the Salem witch trials. Right. She was gonna get oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, she was going to get absorbed. Wanda fights a way out of it. And then this ultimately results into her starting to have her headgear that we all know her from with the comics. And then we see her come into her full Scarlet Witch costume when Agatha is not able to use her magic. So Wanda winds up taking over because when the runes are set up, the, the hex is now fully in her control. Agatha is powerless. And this is just a very kind of crazy situation going on here because when Wanda realizes this, she's coming back to Earth. And obviously with Agatha defeated, she's now having to deal with Hayward and his troops, which are on the ground. And I thought this was a very interesting sequence because as the sword troops are attacking Westview, Wanda's children and Monica are holding them off. And then Hayward gets out of his truck and is trying to shoot at them. And then you see that cool moment when the bullets are going through Wanda, or Monica. Yeah. And yeah. she slows them down, and even Wiccan is using his powers to slow them as well. So, like, the thing with that in the Hayward scene that really kind of just pet peeved me a little bit was, you know, all series they had kind of tried to, and so I, one of the videos I watched made the point of this, like, you know, Hayward almost became a um, a – not a bad guy, you know, in a way like mm-hmm. they were trying, like they, they tried to make him sympathetic. Well, yeah, they like, he was almost a sympathetic bad guy in the way that he was originally, you know, fearful of, of superhumans, especially, you know, the things that Wanda could do. And then all of a sudden it was like, all right, Billy and Tommy, you know, and, and a, a grown man shooting kids, you know, was almost a way of, all right. Yeah. Reminder. He's a bad guy. You know what I mean? Cause the whole time. Yeah. All right. The, the, what do you, the lie about vision was bad. Mm-hmm. The secretiveness. Sure. You know, but like, it was almost empathetic because he's like, I'm afraid of what she could do. And, you know, they, they painted that broad brush of he could be that or she could be that 
villain. And, you know, they had to remind everybody, no, 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 Haywood's the bad guy. Yeah, I think they definitely want to step that stakes up. And he knew that he was running on borrowed time, too, because once our favorite agent, Jimmy Wu, got out of his situation and called Quantico to turn in Hayward, I mean, I thought that was just such a cool moment, too. That Randall Park obviously yeah. is stealing the scenes as well. Yeah, yeah, and just great saying, job. Just saying, yeah, call my bluff. I'm going to turn you in for what you're doing because you're you're setting all these mo- actions into motion that are putting the world in jeopardy, and you are too blind to see what you're doing. The best thing too was uh, they're going to be here within the hour, and you know he Haywood calls his bluff, and then he gets the phone after they go in, and is like, uh, "Can you guys get here within the hour?" Yeah, you yeah, know, like. Well, he knew that he had, a, he had to come with some kind of credible threat. And Hayward knew that if he got loose, there was that possibility. That's why he went all in. That he became so obsessed with this. It almost reminded me of General Ross and the Hulk. Yeah. yeah, Just yeah. a like, weird obsession of you know vindicating themselves and what they're believing in. That, okay, Wanda's this big threat. She needs to be controlled. But when Hayward goes in there and he tries uh, shooting at them, and Monica slows the bullets down. He then gets back in his uh, armored vehicle, and he's gonna he's planning on doing something else. And then who comes in to knock him into the side of the building? But Darcy. Yes, Darcy reemerges. Cat yeah. Dennings obviously just comes in perfect time. She's like, yep, I hope you like going to jail. Yeah. So at this point, the Hex is now released. Vision and Wanda are now having their final goodbyes with their boys. Mm-hmm. Well, don't forget, Agatha is now... Yes. The nosy neighbor. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. Agatha said, you know, you're going to need me and Wanda in a co- in completely new persona, too. Yeah. Very, very um, uh, not empath- uh, not uh, showing any emotion, you know, yeah. almost emotionless uh, in that very cold, you know, and calculated, which she'd never been before, you know. Yeah. This kind of like it reminds me of sometimes when I've seen her written in the comics. Like this is where I really thought that she fully embraced her the Scarlet Witch role. Is that yes? Yeah, she is very cold, but it's not as in calculated. Like, yeah, it's more calculated than just being you know emotionless. Right. But she even says when Agatha's like, "You're going to need me. You can't get rid of me," and she's like, "Don't worry, I'll know where to find you." Yeah. And gives her the fate worse than death, so to speak. With all of a sudden her Sokovian accent coming back. Yeah. Which I I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on that too. Because no, like, it was so like these shows, you know, with people with characters that have accents, where it's just. You know, it's in and out, in and out, in and out. It's kind of like, you know, I was a big Burn Notice guy, and Fiona, you know, started like the first three episodes with an Irish accent and then dropped them all, and then they were like, what happened to your Irish accent, Fiona? And she was like, oh, well, you know, I've been in America long enough. Like, whatever, you know, they wrote it off. But, like, with this, it's like she, the accent's been in and out of each movie, Mm -hmm. you know, from Endgame to, you know, uh, the... Well, from Civil War to... Civil War, yeah. yeah, it's just like... The inconsistency, it's like either let her keep it or drop it, you know? And if you drop it, yeah, there's going to be some people that are going to be up in arms about it. But I feel like the bigger crowd is the crowd of pick a lane. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like either have it or don't. Yeah, because it's, it's one minor – I would say it's an issue, but it's, it's not. But it's like it's so noticeable. It's, it's like yeah, yeah, it's just notice. It's way more noticeable for her to have it back and forth than it would be if she just dropped it. See, I was always going to say they could write it in that when she her powers were accelerating, like she was almost developing a second persona. Yeah. And they could spin it that way if they wanted to. I don't know if they're going to. I mean, they already got enough problems with the multiverse. Yeah, I so, think they got their hands full. Yeah. So as And with maybe some invasions happening. Yes, which we will get into as well. That we see that, obviously, with Agatha taken care of, Wanda's ready to release the Hex. She has that final goodbye with her family. And I thought yeah. th- I thought it was a very interesting line when she told the boys, I'm glad that you chose, you chose me, me to Chose me to be her mom. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, it was weird, but I think that was very much foreshadowing for something Probably. as well. Mm-hmm. And then she has the final goodbye to the vision. Everything fades back to normal. Westview is just in complete shock of what's happened. The they people remember there, everything. They, yeah, I thought that was weird, too. I almost thought, you know, when she walked down the street and she put her hood up, which somebody else pointed out, you know, it's like that's a classic uh, Marvel, you're not going to recognize me superhero move. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the yeah. hood up, like. We still all notice you, like yeah. It's like Steve Rogers walking through a busy like DC street. Oh, let me just put my hat on. Nobody can see me. Yeah, it's a yeah, Clark Scar- Kent glasses. Scarlet deal. Widow pulling her, uh, or not Scarlet uh, Black Widow pulling her hood up in the in uh, the Captain America movie. Uh, no, I just, I mean, it was weird because she's walking down the street and you're like, oh, okay. The, you, I was under the assumption the town's gonna forget everything. You know, like they're all gonna go back to their lives. And then all of a sudden you see like all the side characters that had, you know, been standing watching mm-hmm. the battle 
turn and watch Monica with such disdain. I'm like, oh, they ain't forgetting. Yeah. They I, ain't forgetting this. I almost thought it was something along the lines of, like, if they forgot, they knew that she did something and they couldn't right. figure out sure. what. Because I was going to say, like, how are they going to cover this up? No, they fucking, they knew. Yeah. <laughs> that motherfucker's like, knew. Yeah, that's why I was sitting there like, yeah, they know something's going on. And then she just has that moment with Monica, that final goodbye to the friend. And, and she was saying, you know, if I was in your position, I would have done the same thing to get my mom back. And Wanda just kind of came to terms like, this is what's happened. She takes off before anybody can find her. And as she's flying away, you're seeing the more Quantico troops are coming in to you know, investigate the situation that's happened. Get Haywood. Get Haywood, which, I mean, the show ends on a great note. And then we, now we get to the bonus scenes where Haywood is arrested and Monica is informed by a sword agent that they need to meet her in the theater. And when she goes into the theater, who does she actually really meet? A scrawl. Yes. Who is working for sword and points and says, a friend of your mom wants to have a word with you. And Monica's like, where? And she just points up. Well, you, you've been grounded. Yes. That's not the case anymore. And yeah. And then she points up. Yeah. So it's a very cool thing to see that obviously Monica is going to be involved with Secret Invasion. So, yeah, that so had me think. jump out of my seat. That was like, a, oh, shit. You know, because we, I mean, this whole time we're thinking that this is leading to Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Monica, obviously, we kind of knew was going to be in some sort of position with uh, S.W.O.R.D. Like, you knew that was going to be the outcome because obviously Haywood just got arrested they need a new director and who is the most that uh, the next pick would be monica who was going to be the director had she not have been phased out by the snap you know so i uh i thought yeah i thought i was like oh shit it's this is happening you know yeah i was super excited to see more tiana paris in the mcu bring it on she did an amazing job in the show so now that leads for secret invasion so we have an idea what's going on there and then we get another bonus scene too yeah which this one has a lot more going on to it than I think people realize. I'm, Facts. I'm pretty sure this one was directed by Sam Raimi. Yes, I will. I fully agree with that one. As we see the camera is panning over a mountainside, and we see this little cabin along this mountain, I instantly took this as we're now at Windegore. Uh -huh. Right. That's what I. I mean, when I watch my post cap videos, as I do. Yes. Um, that's what a lot of people like. They were like, "Is it uh, maybe Sokovia? Is it?" Um, uh, fuck, Dr. Uh, Latvia. Latvia. Or Latveria. 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 Or is it your place? Yeah, Wondergore. Wondergore. Wondergore, obviously, if you know anything about the Car Scarlet Witch's um, background, she was raised in Wondergore. Uh, obviously, it's the home of the High Evolutionary, Bova, and a lot of their characters. I don't know how much we're going to see of them in Doctor Strange 2, but the fact that she is there and we see her just enjoying the peace and, and solitude or so we think or so we think and it turns out that she is now in the astral plane as well studying the dark hold which, which we, was which we didn't mention was officially declared as yes. the dark hold yeah it was mentioned during the show as well so i was super happy about that and she is hearing the voices of her ch of her children crying. I'm well, saying so not only is she doing this, but she's now doing it a la Doctor Strange in her astral form. So, yo, she got a power upgrade. While yeah. also having the six circles flying around her, which mm -hmm. a lot of people have different ideas of what that is. Maybe it's the multiverse. Maybe it's, um, you know, the number, another symbol of uh, the hex. You know, a lot of a lot of ideas of what that is. Yeah, there's been so many theories going around with this. So, obviously, since we recapped the episode... What theories do you think now are going to go into Doctor Strange 2? Or were there any that you're like, I want? I wish they covered more in WandaVision? I think it's just my theory with Doctor Strange 2 is just there's going to be some of the, some stuff from this that we just don't realize or aren't picking up on that it's going to be a, a big player for Doctor Strange 2. That it, it's just something that was like a little plot point, a little thing. We're like, oh, okay, that makes sense for what's going on. And we just kind of brush past it and go forward with that. Yeah, the smart thing would be to go back and watch the show uh -huh. before May 22nd, I think it is. Yeah. Um, but no, I I mean, I still would have liked it, you know, maybe if the post credit scene would have had Strange showing up in Westview or mm -hmm. some something. Because it's just, it's dumbfounding to me that... In a year of 2022, you know, with the Avengers and all the things that they do that, you know, you, you just you the, the Doctor Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme doesn't get pulled to this. I mean, I kind of hope that that gets answered in Scarlet Witch because like or in uh, Doctor Strange, the second movie, because like 
How does he not know? Like, that's just, it's like, at least in uh, Iron Man 3 with the shit that was happening, like, they kind of made an excuse for Iron Man, mm. or they made an excuse for Captain America, and vice versa for all the other characters throughout time, you know, essentially. Like, they've all been busy and wrapped up in their own shit that, like, they've never been able to help each other, and that's kind of what helped the individual movies move along without being like, well, why isn't, did he just call Hulk? Yeah. Well, Hulk's been in space. Like, he can't help him. Um, so, like, to the idea of, the fact that this hex is probably 45 minutes down the highway uh, across the bridge in New Jersey <laughs> happening, yeah. you know, like the dude can blink and be there and he's not there. Like it just, it, it didn't have to be like a big scene. It could have literally just been Superman and Shazam, the boots and the cape landing on the ground and, and looking at the Westview sign close. You know what I mean? Like that could have been it. That would have been perfect to me. I would have been okay with that, especially with Paul Bettany's amazing trolling yeah. that was promising the Luke Skywalker-esque cameo that turned out to be him. I mean, not even that. It's just like from being like this, you know, common yeah. sense. Like, hello, you're the Sorcerer Supreme, and you're meaning to tell me that this giant hex that was taking up an entire county of northern New Jersey didn't, like, set off your radar to be like, the fuck? Yeah. I got to get there. You know what I mean? The only thing I'm going to see they're going to say is in Doctor Strange 2, there was a reason he wasn't there. Right, no, and like, that's yeah. what I hope. I yeah, really, yeah. really, really hope for my sense of just, like, answers that we get something that says, yeah, I couldn't be there because I was doing this. Yeah, you know they, what I mean? They're going to have to do something for it because, obviously, with Wanda now in possession of the Darkhold and is learning that she is essentially going to become the destroyer of worlds, and she is now getting her powers boosted from somewhere that even at one point in the, in the show, she didn't know how. And I think that that story has got a lot to be told. Am I saying is it going to be Mephisto, which I know everybody in the Internet ran with? It's hard to say because there is uh, there was a rumor that was confirmed about a, a, a deleted episode. That was going to have a little bit more. Uh, well, there's a deleted scene of Senior Scratchy yeah, like, that's turning I mean. into some like wicked beast yeah and like that scene where he ate the, the the insect that was supposed to be him like man like turning into that beast and then eating the insect but that never came to be yeah that's what i was, I was referring to yeah, maybe it wasn't an episode but it was another scene that was gonna have a lot more clarity in introducing a demon character who was that going to be hard to say wanda has enough connections with him that it could have been Meph mephisto but i doubt it i think if they're going to make him into the mcu it's going to be a big announcement of who he's casted as so it's hard to say, but with her power levels now spiking to that level that Doctor Strange is going to have to get brought in is really going to set the pace for the the yeah the multiverse of madness. Uh, it's such a bad time twister. Always well, me off. I mean, that's you know kind of what it's supposed to do. Yes, and it works very, very well. But some other theories that were going around with this, obviously we didn't see any more introduction of the, of the X-Men into the MCU. I think they're still waiting on to do that now. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's similar to the Krasinski thing with... Um, with uh, oh, the aerospace engineer? Yeah, with that, where it's like, you know, they're they're not going to uh, just introduce a character for the sake of introducing it. Like, if they're going to put the X-Men in the movie, you know, they're probably going to announce a cast or at least certain characters that are going to be played by certain people before they just say, okay... You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't think that they're just going to say, okay, there's mutants and then not have like, I don't know, John Kiso from Letterkenny show up as Wolverine. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm still talking that in to <laughs> yeah. fruition. So put it out. Let to that be, you know? Um, but no, seriously though, like, I don't think they're going to not have, you know, this person's playing this mutant and then we're going to introduce mutants. You know what I mean? Like the same thing they did with Avengers. It's not like they went and said, all right, we're doing an Iron Man movie. No, they got Robert Downey Jr. first, and then they're like, all right, now we're going to make Iron Man. Yeah, and it's a smart play. I mean, Marvel, we we have to trust what they've done. They've, they've built the brand. They haven't really shot too many misfires yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here saying that this show changed television to me. I mean, I look at this show, and I'm like, this was flawless on so many levels. The people that, you know, hated it and expected more, I'm sorry that you feel that way because this show delivered on so many ways. There was mystery, there was intrigue, there was character-driven plot points, there was sadness, there was comedy, you know what I mean? Like, there mm. was everything on so... And then there was action. That last episode flipped everything on its head yeah. and gave you a hell of a, you know, 25 minutes worth of action, you know, before it came to a, a crescendo, so... 
I I definitely think that if you are you know hating the show, I think you're missing the point of it. Pad? No, uh, it was a great show. It took two characters that for me I honestly didn't give two shits about, and it's not through any any wrongdoing of the actor or, or actress. It's just didn't really care much for them. They're on screen, cool, you know. Didn't hate it, but it took two characters that I really didn't care for and gave me a real vested interest in. This show did a lot and really set the tone of what to expect from the MCU on Disney+. Plus. I think for being the replacement show for Falcon and Winter Soldier coming out the gate, which it was, right? I think they had a lot of eyes on them, and uh, the bar was set very, very high. I think initially when the show came out, the expectation level was almost to a place where they knew they weren't going to hit it, but if it was something so different than we have seen from the MCU... It's one of the reasons I really love the show. Sure. That when we got to episode four, and as soon as you hear that Jimi Hendrix kick in, and I always say that that's the moment the show really sunk its teeth you in. No, it's okay to be different. Like, yeah. I mean, I people, Doctor Strange is a horror film, essentially. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. just prepare yourselves for that. Like, it's not going to be, you know, the chummy, ho-hum, you know, LOL, light heart laughter uh, oh, Captain said shit. You know, like, it's not going to be that. It's going to be dark, and it's going to probably be... PG-13, if not R, you know what I mean? Like, you can't have a horror film and not have it rated R. It's yeah. Just, it's just a reality that we're seeing right now. It is what it is, and I, I fully am embracing it because I have been very critical of the MCU about how they make cookie-cutter films. The, it's all, the basic wash, rinse, repeat. When something can stick out and be different, it really resonates to more people. Yep. WandaVision did that. WandaVision did the slow burn. It gave a lot of interest to characters like Pat touched upon that nobody outside the Avengers fan base of comics really cared about. Well, I mean, for me, like Scarlet, you know, widow and, and really took the turn for me in Ultron when, you know, she had that heart to heart with Hawkeye and he was like, Hey, you can sit in this room where you can come out and you can be an Avenger, but mm -hmm. either way I'm going out there, you know, and he busts through the door. He's like, Oh shit, here we go. And then all of a sudden she has that Epic walkout. And I was like, all right, this character is, is sick, you know, that's sick, like, to, to sack up and, and let's do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then the Vision character changed for me when, you know, he was <laughs> having her on lockdown yeah. and then gets crushed by her only to come back and then get crushed again. I was like, all right, like, you know, he's funny. Like, this is cool. Um, so I, I, I was excited for the show when I knew the two of them were coming out. Like, I, and it delivered. Yeah, I definitely think it did. And one other area that I thought they really hit well is they borrowed just enough from various comic stories and made it their own. Which is, I think, the point of movies. Yeah. I really think that's what movies... Like, you don't need to be verbatim of X story. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But you can pick and plot and pull and then make... I mean, again, this is their own universe. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it doesn't need to be quote-unquote canon to the comics or... or uh, uh, continuity with the comics, it can be your own shit. You know, you can pull and pick and prod from different things and be like, ooh, I really like the House of M thing. I really like that story for Wanda. I like that story for Vision. And you can pull it together and, I mean, Kevin Feige matches it in his brain and then spews out magic. Yeah, no, it was absolutely brilliant to see where they borrowed. Like I say, if you really want to go to the comic shop and pick up some uh, stories, Avengers Disassembled is one. Tom King's The Vision story is amazing, and they yeah. borrowed a lot from this. Avengers West Coast, it's a slept-on run in the 90s, but it's definitely worth picking up. And you can see a lot about where they're going to go with Vision moving forward. It's going to be something that I think fans will really be more inclined to go to the stores and pick up because I know that we ran with a lot of crazy theories, but the show had everybody guessing. And, I mean, that's what we do. <laughs> it, it, it's what we do. You know, like, I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here just bullshitting. Oh, exactly. Like, I mean, the theor the theorizing and the, ooh, you know, I think it's going to be Reed Richards showing up. He's got to be the space engineer. And then, the you know, the, well, they got us again. You know, like, that's the point of the show, you mm -hmm. know. And they hit it right on the head, too, because for being without a Marvel news show for almost a year, this had a lot of high hopes on it. And when we got it, it was like, okay, we had Avengers Endgame. Changed everything. We haven't really had too much MCU content since. I always say Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is part of it, and after seeing the Darkhold, you can't tell me otherwise. Agents well, the of book Shield. doesn't look the same. 
Yeah, we can argue <laughs> different covers. Still say, same hey, story. man, I mean, it matters. It ma- I mean, Hydra Soap, are you going to try and pull that one, too, to connect it? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. say that, too. No, I mean, there's enough Easter eggs that they can tie in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Anything else, and I think, unfortunately, is I lost just, in the shuffle. It's so funny, though, because when Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. started, it literally, like, what, season two ran to Ultron? Like, yep. that literally, they're the ones who found the castle where they were holding the twins? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I mean, and then all of a sudden it just was like, all right, we can't keep up with this anymore. But it just shows that you can keep a show tied to a universe. Yeah, and I, th- I thought they did it brilliantly, too. And then whatever the future of them is going to be, because I you know now this show has sparked so much interest that everyone wants to see Darcy and Jimmy in their own X-Files type show. Yep, I this, saw that. This could be a spinoff into Agents of Sword. You never know if that's going to be the case. Hey, Maybe. I mean, it, you know what they, I mean, it could be, you know, during Secret Evasion, mm-hmm. the television show, you know, that could lead to something yeah. uh, with them. I think the fact that the fans have reacted so positively for this, for the most part, that there's so many different elements that they can borrow from and move forward into a different direction that they didn't even know about. Yeah. It's what, I mean, it could, pro- I mean, think of the number of show. I mean, Monica could, uh, who knows what's going to happen with her. I mean, probably going to be in, um, uh, what's her favorite, the sequel. Oh, uh, Captain Marvel Captain 2. Marvel yeah, 2. She's, she's probably that. going to be there, you know, and I mean, this could lead to uh, uh, that the Wanda, you know, the Jimmy Woo show, you know, yeah. I mean, like just like uh, Mandalorian, you know, sparked all those different shows that now are coming off of that, that nobody would have thought of before. I mean, both Fett getting his own show and, and all that stuff like you just you never know. You never know, and that's the beauty of what this show was able to bring. I mean, that's something that it's going to be looked back upon is, OK, it had high marks to hit. It did it its own way. It definitely gave the fans a lot to discuss and had everybody guessing. And when you could tell how crazy the fans were guessing, that's how you know it's a hit. If this was something that nobody was paying attention to or cared about, it wouldn't have got a fraction of the media coverage it did. I mean, dude, people uh, crashed Disney Plus. Yeah, multiple like it, times. In the last, what, two years that Disney Plus has been out? Not one thing. 16 months. 16 months. Not one thing has caused it to stop other, you know? other than the first day. Yeah, right. yeah, but outside of that there hasn't been a single problem. Not even the last episode of Mandalorian. Yeah. Which that's that that stat alone just blows my mind. I mean, to me it makes perfect sense because this was everybody was dropping what they were doing on Friday and watching the show at some point mm-hmm. across the world. Yeah. And just to see how feverish everybody was about this it just goes to show that if you put the time in to tell the good story and you can have characters that maybe are not household names, you can really go someplace and really make them into larger than life characters, yeah. which this show did. Wait till Falcon and Winter Soldier blow your socks off. I know. We have two weeks to get ready for that. And that was my show that I was most excited to see come to Disney Plus because I have an idea what stories they're going to be doing from it. They're taking two that are going to really stand out. There's the late Mark Renwell's uh, run where he did switch Captain America out. Yep. And I think they're obviously changing the story for the show, but it's going to have the same elements. And plus, I think Ed Brubaker's last Captain America story. Well, it's not even two weeks. It's a week and a half. Yeah, it's Yeah, it's Yeah, it's Friday after next. It's next Friday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the 18th. It's just it's moving so Or the 19th because the Snyder's coming out the 18th. But I feel like I need the two weeks just to recover from this show. Fuck that. I wanted it now. I wanted it Friday, baby. Keep me going. Well, Friday is when Assembled comes out. And it's going to be breaking down the behind the scenes of WandaVision. So oh, okay, that'll be, cool. That, that'll be worth it. If it's anything like the making of they did for Mandalorian, that'll be highly worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So we definitely have a lot to look forward to. And WandaVision set the bar pretty high. Falcon Winter Soldier is next on deck. Can't wait to talk about that. But before we end this segment, we definitely want to plug 30 and Nerdy. There is a massive uh, Council of Nerd recap of WandaVision coming out this week. So definitely make sure you're following 30 and Nerdy podcast. Shout out to Tyler Mack. And you'll hear that episode where it's me, Rich from 3FN, Dre Driven, JT from the East Coast Avengers, and Tyler talking all things WandaVision. But let us know what you think. WandaVision is in the books. What was your thoughts? What was your reaction? What was your predictions that didn't come true? What did you hope was going to happen? And uh, let's just talk everything that's going on with Wanda Maximoff moving forward, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Anthony. And I'm Dr. Issues. And we're hosts of Capes on the Couch, the podcast where comics get counseling. Superheroes don't always get to go home happy. That's where we come in. We offer psychiatric and mental health analysis of comic book characters. So check us out at capesonthecouch.live and across all social media platforms at Capes on the Couch. 
Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and it is time to recap the UFC's big fight night this past Saturday, UFC 259. Yeah, yeah, baby. Three title fights, four champions. It went down in Vegas. A lot of eyes were on twitch.tv slash 67 podcast for our live reactions, and thank you so much for tuning in for that. But I got the panel in studio, and we have a lot to discuss about this. So, Pad, let us talk about the three big title fights. Yeah, so the first one was in the bantamweight division uh, between Peter Yan, who was the champion, going up against Al Jermaine Sterling. Uh, and this one, bit of controversy. Definitely, I think Dana White's glad that the next fight went the way it did because it washed away some of the bad taste a lot of pe- people had in their mouths, uh, where Al Jermaine Sterling defeated. Peter Yan uh, via disqualification because of an illegal knee Peter Yan had used uh, during the where is it there, there it is uh, the fourth round. Coach, your thoughts on this? <sighs> Disappointing. You mm. know, I um, not that I really thought that um, Aljamain. Uh, you know, it, it felt like it was a close fight. It definitely felt uh, towards those later rounds that Yan was um, starting to get the timing at Aljamain, starting to figure out figure him out a little bit. And just like I said on the show last week, I thought Aljamain threw, you know, some wild and crazy things that once Jan catches him, um, making a mistake that he would capitalize. Inevitably, you know, I really felt like he was, especially in that later uh, third and then the beginning of that fourth round up until the knee. Uh, My problem, though, was the aftermath. Mm -hmm. I, so, like I, you know, talked about last week, been rewatching The Ultimate Fighter, and too many times I've seen illegal blows with the ref with the doc, with the doctor and the referee walking in and saying to the fighter do you want to continue yeah that shit needs to stop it needs to stop because a you're now putting it on the fighter and putting him in a impossible position impossible mm-hmm. because if he says yes i want to continue depending on the significance of that blow might not be the same fighter and in this case uh for aljamain he was obviously not you know cold you know yeah. out so uh and and when you look back at like anthony smith versus john jones you know with that uh, uh, illegal elbow right or illegal knee as well you know he came back he said i could fight you know and ultimately lost because he was you know literally knocked you know he was knocked dizzy oh yeah um so Aljamain, you know, you, you need and and then the ultimate fighter this season that I just watched, Joe Lazon hit somebody with an elbow to the back of the head, and the guy was, you know, the, uh, Cole I think that was the fighter was like, "Do you want to continue?" He's like, "I, you know, I came here to fight, so I want to fight." And he was, you know, doozy. You know, he was on Dream Street. Lazon take it, took advantage of it, won the fight outright. Yeah. Um, it, it can't be in their hands. The doctor and the referee need to come in and they need to determine based on the evaluation that. No, this fighter cannot continue, and this match needs to end. And if that's the case, then so be it. But you cannot leave it on the fighter because, you know, in the aftermath of it, if you know if he says yes, then he'll probably lose the fight. And whether he gets a rematch or not, who knows? If he says no, you know, maybe among the community or you know the MMA fans, uh, oh, he's a pansy. He took the easy way out just because he took he an was illegal act- shot. He was acting. Yeah, or he was acting. Mm-hmm. You know, he's fine. Um, you know, he knew that he was going to win the belt with that illegal blow. Like he knew this, you know, and the conspiracy theory comes out, you know I mean? It's like, no, the referees and, and, and them need to come in and step in and take charge of that. And that was my biggest problem. Yeah. Pat? No, the fight was definitely a bad luck for UFC and MMA in general because the fight was pretty good up until that illegal knee. And the thing, you know, we got to know that wasn't the first instance where Algermain was down, you know, and, and, uh, Yan had to wait. The only difference is, is in the prior instance, I think it happened at least a couple times. I know it happened once for sure, maybe even twice. Uh, you know, it happened and Yan waited. And then for whatever reason, I know some people have, have gone out there claiming his corner, you know, told him to, yeah, told him to do it. I watched the clip back and I heard somebody. Now, maybe this is just, you know, whatever effect and, and my brain put it there. But I thought I heard somebody say when he went down, I thought I heard somebody and I don't know who say down or downed opponent or something. So was, down was said at some point in the midst of all that, you know, bruh. Well, I heard, so uh, DC came on and was saying that he heard the corner say, yet, yet, which in Russian means no. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and the weird thing was during the fight, I don't know if you guys heard this, but they talked and Habib was over there sitting by Jan's uh, camp. Cr- camp. And he heard, allegedly, 
them say, knee him, knee him, knee him. Right. And this is from Habib. Right. And this is what he told DC. Right. So, like, again, another, like you were saying, a bad look on the UFC because DC should have been reporting on that, yeah. period. Yeah. Go on. Sorry, I mean, Pat. No, you're fine. So, you know, who's to say, but... Yan, Yan's a champion. Yan, I will pull up his record. I know I read it last week, but it's been a week, so I entirely forget. Yan is a champion. He is no spring chicken. This isn't his first fight. This is his 17th professional fight. So, you know, he's not a spring chicken. He ain't new at this. He's been around the block. You know, so he should he should know better. And he knew better, at least in the one instance or a couple instances before that, where Sterling was down and he waited. This shouldn't have happened. I think where the UFC screwed the pooch was in the whole aftermath of deciding whether or not to continue the fight. When he sat up and tried to, couldn't get up, sat back down, I think he laid back down at one point, if I remember right, and then tried to stand up the second time and couldn't get back up, that should have called it. I agree with Coach wholeheartedly that you need to go the NFL route with the way they took concussions. Now, I realize this might be apples to oranges, but as Ken says, it's all produce. Mm-hmm. You know, they need to follow the NFL in this example and take that decision out of the fighter's hands. Mm-hmm. That because, yeah, it's it's MMA fighters compared to NFL players, but they're all still on that same mentality of, you know, brush the dirt off, get back in there, you know, you know, and, and push through it. They're always going to, like Coach said in the Ultimate Fighter he was watching, you are always going to get a fighter that is even possibly going to go, no, I came here to fight. I want to keep fighting. Short of them having a broken bone where they can't stand or can't fight, they're going to want to keep coming back. You know, so you need to take this, you know, decision out of their hands, do some sort of test or whatever it is. I realize concussion protocol tests in the NFL take a bit, but you need to come up with some sort of test in this instance to go, can this guy continue? Can this guy not? Because you don't want to run into an instance where you think something's wrong and it's not, and you pull a guy out and he's not been here and you just screwed a guy out of a title. You need to come up with some sort of test that you can do there in the octagon. Don't make time time a factor. Like, all right, take as long as you need, figure it out. You know, the fans won't mind. I think the fans would rather prefer, you know, a fighter being okay rather than, you know, a championship ending with a bogus doctor stoppage, you know, Come up with something, take the decision out of their hands, and fix whatever the fuck you did after that fight. Because there was no re- as bad a shape as he looked it in, and I don't subscribe to that conspiracy theory that he was acting. There's no way a fighter would want to win a title in that way because it's borderline, you know, a dick heel and in, in WWE way to do it. And and there I would like to think that fighters in the UFC are a little bit above that style of you know being a, a heel. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think he wanted to win that way, so. Having him stand there where he needed to be supported up during the results being read was not a good look. Having him get interviewed by Joe Rogan that afterwards. Was atrocious. It, that was also bad. Having him get interviewed by Joe Rogan after the fight was over when all go back and twitch you know, watch the live stream if it's still up. We're all sitting there going, What the fuck are you doing? Get him medical attention. And Rogan finally goes, Oh, well, I'm being told we need to stop so you can get some medical attention. No shit, Sherlock, that's where he should have been. Well, the problem was that they asked him if he wanted to do the interview, and at first he had said Well, of course no, he's gonna say But then he said yes. Of course he's going to say yes. I Well, to me, it, yeah, again, they shouldn't have even... Again, d- decision should have been out of his hands. Yeah. A couple thoughts. One, I think the UFC really needs to look at the downed opponent rule. And I'm not saying that Sterling was milking time, but it's one of those situations where when fighters are in that position... Are they doing this in protection of themselves sure. or buying time? I'm just sure. bringing, I'm just bringing well, that. Well, yeah, they are. Well, well, I you, mean, you've heard the, you've heard the same argument with the NFL. Yeah, yeah I mean, you've NFL, heard NFL soccer. You know, name a contact sport. It's bread and broth. Dude, up. I mean, think about the times that fighters have uh, knowing this the position and situation that they're in. You know, let's just say a good example is in a fight that I don't remember the fighters, but I remember the the scenario was uh, the guy was up against the cage. And, uh, you know, Rogan was on commentary and he kept putting his hand back and forth off the mat, you know, being that he was bent over, which would be three things down on the mat, Mm -hmm. can't knee. And he would constantly, you know, play the game of my hands on the mat, my hands off the mat, my hands on the mat, my hands off the mat. And Rogan even said, hey, he is taking advantage of the rule set right now uh, forward by the UFC of a downed opponent. And for him, this is very smart. So, yeah, I mean, 
He was. I, to me, he was. You know, yeah. I mean, he knew his position. He knew what he was doing. And I think that it's something the UFC has to look at because I think Jan was just frustrated with how Sterling was doing that because when this bantamweight title was going on, obviously we know Sterling had been long asking for this fight. First round, he came out swinging, throwing a lot of crazy shots at Jan. Jan was caught off his game. I mean, I feel like think Sterling won round one. Two, Jan started picking him apart a little bit. This one kind of was the back and forth one. Yeah, they hit him with the fucking say. STO. Yeah. Which was like, oh my, like when DC said it was a choke slam, I'm like, uh, hey, DC, how big of a wrestling fan are you? Don't yeah, you know an STO when you see it? He hit him with an STO. Yeah, that, it was 100% was, an STO. Yeah. But then Jan started getting his timing down in the third, and I think that was clear cut, and I think he was on his way to win in the fourth. I'm not saying Sterling knew that he was losing the fight, but I think in that situation, the ring awareness about the downed opponent rule, I think definitely came into play. Did Jan lose his cool? Yes, in my opinion, fully. You can say your coaches are yelling at you to do X, Y, and Z, but at the end of the day, you're the one who has to pull the trigger to Dude, do it. Dude, and I've seen so many like from these Ultimate Fighter fights and guys not. I mean, I'm sure that when you are in the octagon that you are unaware of your uh, surroundings as far as people and the noise the that's coming in. The world gets quiet. Yeah, like the noise that you hear coming in because everybody's screaming at you at the same time, and all you probably hear is just... You know, and that's all you probably hear. So when he, maybe the one thing that he did hear was the clear yay and thought, you know, it was knee. And so he did it. But yeah, you could definitely tell there was a level of frustration. There was a level of frustration and just boiled over. So when he hit him, I mean, he hit him flush. And I know there was a great argument Rich brought up on the stream about, you know, down opponents. and uh, Right. It's something that we can all debate about till the end of the day. But I think it's something the UFC should take a look at. Now, that being said, the minute the judge or the doctors hit the ring... The fight's done. Mm-hmm. You can't hit a reset. The fact you're trying to stand him back up and the fact that you egregiously ask him, do you want to continue? Of course. If you're in a combat sport such as MMA, you're in there to win, to go out on your shield. We've only seen a handful of examples mm-hmm. where people got a very sobering reality and said, this ain't for me, and they have not fought since those moments in the UFC. We can backtrack through the lineage if you really want to get nitty-gritty about it. But the point is, Sterling knows that this is a title shot. He does not want to go out like this, but he's in no clear-cut condition yeah. to win. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the, and you and you could tell based off his reaction after the fight was over that he didn't, you know, he didn't sell it or NBA flop it. You know, yeah. he didn't fake this because Dana wanted to put the belt on him afterwards. He threw it to the ground. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like that either. Well, he knew that he should not have won the belt I, like because he didn't matter. want to win it like that. I understand and, that, but that, it's not the belt's fault. It's not. It's you know, it's not the the fault of uh, the rules. You know, and it's no fault of yourself. Oh, well, I agree with you. I agree with you one hundred percent. But at, at well, the same what time. I mean by no fault of the rules is it's no fault of you know that the fact that a disqualified champion loses the belt because. Uh, and I hate to say it, but Uncle Dave made a very good point that, uh, you know, if that's the case and you're a champion and you're losing the fight, then like in wrestling, you would fucking get disqualified all the time. Right. But the point is, I think that's something they, they need to just call it a no contest and make the belt vacant. Like they need that, to look at that. Actually, right. that when after the, with the aftermath, I was like, that's the exact that's the exact thing that they need to do. Yeah. They, it's they, just strip the champion of the belt. No contest. And then you set up now. The, the rematch with the unification Absolutely. of the belt. Yeah. Absolutely. You do right, that. and I agree with you. Well, everything you said, Coach, I just think for, for Sterling, in the heat of the moment, emotions were high. Yeah. You know, it was it was a high tense, stressful moment. We've all been in situations, not necessarily to that degree, where we've no, tens, tensions are high, emotions are running high. We do something that five minutes, hour later, we're looking back and going, son of a bitch, that and, was really dumb. And no, I get that. I just, to me, you know, you don't disrespect the belt. You don't disrespect the... The sport, you know, which essentially by throwing the belt you are, you know, that's to me. I mean, th- no, why did Medusa drop the uh, WWE oh, yeah. belt in WCW? Because that's a you. spit in the face. So you chucking that belt, you know, Shane Douglas, same principle. You chucking that belt on the ground is a slap in the face of tradition. And I just, I wasn't cool with that. And heat of the moment or not, you just, you just don't do that. He you know, should, he, hand it to a teammate, you know, hand it to one of your crew members, just Walk away, don't throw it on the ground. Right, and I I fully get that point. I'm not saying you're wrong about it, but what I'm saying is in this moment, he knew about the struggle to get to the title shot anyway because he'd been passed over numerous times. Sure. So the fact he got it and he won it by this method is not what he wanted to do, and I'm sure that is just 
His pride overtook the moment, well, however disoriented he was. But here's my problem, though, to that now reaction, because this is what pissed me off the most. And DC and Ariel talked about it on their show, which was really good points. You chuck the belt down. You act all upset. And then you, three and a half hours later after the show's over, pictures are out. Oh, yeah. yeah. You oh, partying. Yeah. yeah. Then you're calling out, uh, who was the dude that was on... Uh, 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 T- uh, AEW. Oh, Cejudo? Cejudo. You're calling out Cejudo, oh, saying so. that you want to fight with him. Um, you know, and, and to me, it's like, you know, how do you go out? Now, I listen, you earned, you know, you, you won the fight, whatever, and you have had a, what, probably seven to eight week training camp. Yeah. You've been busting your ass. You cut weight. You did all this. The blow off. With that after party with your friends and family, I 100% get because that is deserved win, lose, or draw. Mm-hmm. But you don't post the pictures of the shots of the of the uh, you know your crowd, your peeps, your people, you know, all hovering around you with the belt at the center of the table, you know, and act as if like this is upsetting you. Yeah, that's the thing. The perception is reality. Clearly, two stories were getting told during this one. Oh yeah. So I'm not saying he was acting, but somebody should have been smarter and said... Taking the phone? Yeah. Grab his phone, say, you're laying low. Yeah. You know, really kind of honed him in because you can't say you're so upset about winning the belt that way and then you're good enough to do an interview with Joe Rogan right after, which I thought they should not have done no. right. in any which way, shape, or form. Because I'm sorry, if you stop the fight because of an illegal knee... That tells me this fighter is in no condition to talk, especially when you look like you don't know where you are or what day of the week it is. Exactly. Yeah, that interview was uh, that interview showed that he was still very loopy. And Rogan even has said in the past that we should not be interviewing concussed fighters. Right now, well, that was because of the DC. Right, but <laughs> but it wasn't diagnosed at that point that he was concussed. I know he went to the hospital and everything came back clear. But either way, you as the UFC press should say, you know what, we probably shouldn't talk right now and take the L on it. The fact they didn't was it just painted the worst picture they could for this. Because now, obviously, the conspiracy theory is he was faking to get the belt. Now, he's obviously, Dana White has said they're going to run it back. Sterling, oh, yeah. Sterling has came out and said, when I'm healthy, I'll run it back with him. So he just wants to be fully recovered. Just say, at least he didn't do like Brock Lesnar did at WrestleMania 34. Oh, no, he didn't. For all the belt at Vince. Yeah, but this is a situation, well, if you're all cleared by the doctors at night, you're good enough to be out partying and celebrating your win. Why do you need to fully recover from the fight to have a rematch? I don't know. The optics here, something just is not it's adding just very up. very funky. It's very, very funky. funky. So they are obviously going to run back the fight between Peter Yan and Aljamain Sterling at and some point. And that 100% can be a main event. Oh, yeah. Card. Oh, oh, it's going to be. That the lines have just sold itself. Can be a card. You know, that can be the main event of a major card. Oh, I fully see it happening. It's going to be the main event. Yeah. So we'll have to just wait and see when that gets ran back. Obviously, that was the lowest point of the evening, but yeah. a lot more highlights, though, from the two main events. Yeah, so if anyone was happy about the results of the next matchup, it would be Dana White for making everyone instantly forget about the tr- the train wreck that was that last match, uh, because next up was in the Winton women's featherweight division, uh, where champion Amanda Nunes took on uh, Megan Anderson, uh, and the fight did not last long, ending at two minutes and three seconds into the first round, with Amanda Nunes defeating Megan Anderson by with a triangle armbar. Uh, submission to be re- uh, retain her uh, featherweight championship. Dude, Coach. fuck. <laughs> My God. God I mean, damn. <laughs> like, I, I left the show <laughs> thinking that, you know, Anderson would have a shot just because of the size and stature of her going against Nunez, you know, from the not only the weigh-ins, but just the, the you know, the, the pose and everything. Um, but, dude, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Nunez, and I, Nunez just came out and – Literally, the first punch that Nunez throw, I think, hit uh, Anderson on the shoulder. Didn't even flush, you know, catch her. From that moment on, Anderson's eyes went from a uh, normal human size to about 17 feet wide. Yeah. She was a deer in the headlights. She was absolutely oh, yeah. she scared. Had no, she had nothing. I mean, I don't want to say she was scared, but there was a, a moment of, you know, come to Jesus. Yep. Oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, and it was over from there. It yeah. was over. There was never yeah. a shot. There was never a shot. Nunez literally dissected her, had got her on the ground, uh, and and I, can't, I mean, had her in could have put her in any position she wanted, mm. but she opted for a triangle choke armbar. Yeah, dude, what? Like, yeah. wrap your head around that real quick. I mean, 
You've seen triangles. You've seen arm bars. You ever seen them together? <laughs> nope. I've only seen it one other time, and I believe it was Korean Zombie pulled it off. Something like that. Yeah. But it was absolutely wild. Pad. No, absolutely bonkers fight. Amanda Nunes truly, truly is the, the greatest women's MMA fighter of all time. I, I don't think you can even debate that. No. You know, and it really says something when you have a lot of the male fighters saying, yo, I don't want to fight her. Even, John, you know, somebody asked John Jones about it, and John's like, yeah, I don't want to go anywhere near her. That they, they, she could easily run through a couple of the, the men's divisions. Nunez is on a whole different level. She's the GOAT. Sorry, it, it, end of conversation. I don't think it's debatable anymore. She has literally closed down the featherweight division. Megan Anderson is a former champion from Invicta. She is not somebody that they just threw at her. And Nunez tore her apart. Yep. It wasn't even close. Like, just the skill level just wasn't there. So now, where do you go from here? Oh, Dana said they ain't getting rid of it yet, so we'll, well, we'll these, see. They're going to have to find somebody to step up from 135 to 145. I don't know who that is. I know that Juliana Pena, I believe, is getting the 135 shot. Pena's called her out. Yeah, and Dana was at the presser after, and he said, I like that fight. We, we'll do that because they want her back in the – they want Nunez back in the cage as soon as possible. Yeah. Well, why wouldn't they? No, I mean, exactly. It's like, Chris, she could be back in the cage this weekend. Yeah. Uh, the only fight I could see them making, but they dropped the ball with it was Cyborg 2. That's the that's the only one. I don't even want to. I mean, because I know there's the talk about Shevchenko a third time. Listen, yeah, that's what uh, Ariel and DC said. Yeah, was that's what they want to see. I, but I don't like Nunez has already beat her twice. I, there's and Grant. The, yeah, but they said the second time was second time was closer. closer. It yeah. was closer, but I mean, it, to get that trilogy fight to really make it something, I I don't know. Like I just I don't see. I mean. For a trilogy fight, normally it's got to be 1-1. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, I mean, to see it happen again. And, and don't take it the wrong way. I like Shevchenko. I think she's a great champion. She's a great fighter. She's not Nunez. And I'm not saying Nunez would steamroll her, but... I it's s- just, she's some. I mean, she's something else. Yeah. I, I, I mean, everything was pointing in Megan Anderson's direction of this can be the one opportunity that somebody takes her at 145, and, mm. or takes Nunez at 145, and... There was just no answer. Yeah, so I don't know what the UFC is going to do with their future, but, I mean, obviously, Nunez has to be in the pound-per-pound pound male or female fighter Absolutely. conversation. Yeah, you can't, you, yeah. You, you can't, you say, can't otherwise. say otherwise. Yeah, you can't say otherwise. She's got to be in the top three, at yeah. least. At least. At top, yeah. top two. Yeah. yeah. You can't, I mean, how do you not say that she's... Uh, top two, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you just argue like with what Habib is in that conversation. John Jones is. I mean, I, you could say Habib is still retired, but still, if you, if you throw that argument throw in there, the rankings, he's still number one. Yeah, so it's it's one of those situations where Nunez has already carved her legacy. Anything else from here on out is is just adding more to the repertoire. Enough said. Yeah, just I mean, there's nothing else that can be done at the 145 class because that's wiped out. Yeah, and I mean, really at 135. There's really not much there either. I Only mean, a couple handful you know, of players. Yeah, I mean, so it's like once she wipes out this division, it's like, you know, I, I know that uh, Dana and uh, I mentioned that there is a 145 fight coming up, but the girl that's fighting it, it's 1-0. and all. Yeah. And if she wins, you don't put her up against Nunez just because she's, you know, the only body in the division, you know? What they'd be smart to do is do an ultimate fighter season and the winner gets Nunez. I'd, I'd be fine with that. Do that. I mean, honestly, it's going to come down to that point. Either that, or you do like they did for, I believe, it was season four, where you brought in former fighters and gave them the shot to get. That would reclaimed. be the most sense because you just can't bring up. I mean, the, I know there's the the pro fighting women league that mm-hmm. where Megan Anderson came from, and she was the 145 champion there. Yeah, you know, you can't keep plucking people from there because I mean they're under contract, so that doesn't work. So yeah, I think the only thing that you can do is try and toss some names into a hat into a ultimate fighter scenario and, and have them fight for the opportunity to lose. That's all you can do at this stage. But the main event, though, to yeah. close out UFC 259, Pat. Yeah, it was for the uh, light heavyweight division championship where champion Jan Blahovitz was taking on middleweight champion Israel Adesanya. And uh, Jan Blahovitz uh, retained his uh, light heavyweight championship uh, in unanimous decision with the scores being 49-46, 49-45, 49-45. Coach, your thoughts. Uh, first off, I, we should have probably talked about this. Or, I mean, maybe we'll bring it up in the overall card, but the judges were fucking atrocious. Judges were awful all to night. Give eight, to give a 10-8 round in either of those two rounds, and they also gave some 10-8s uh, earlier in the night. Yeah. Blasphemy. 
Like, I mean, how do you give a 10-8 round when Adesanya was equal in strikes, just not maybe, you know, octagon control? So, it's funny you should say that. I have said scorecard in front of me. Uh, this was posted on Saturday night, Sunday morning, uh, and on Twitter, and I happened to save it to my phone. Uh, the two refs in question who had scored 10-8 rounds, I should note, both scored 10-8 rounds in the final and fifth round. In case you're curious when it happened. So, it was uh, both... Fighter, both uh, refs. I won't even attempt to say their names. Yeah, don't. It, I won't say names because I don't want to see and send people after him. Because ah, oh, why'd you do it? No, uh, both refs scored ten eight rounds in the fifth and final round. See, but that's ridiculous. It's 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 ridiculous on so many different levels because a ten eight is you got your ass completely just whipped. absolutely, whipped. and you survived the round. Yeah, you got dominated, so but you survived. You got bent over your opponent and he spanked you like you're you're a kid. But yeah. Adesanya started the first two minutes of that fifth round on his feet and landing shots. Yeah. Oh yeah. So you can't say that he got his ass kicked that bad. It's just the judging in MMA. They need to start getting former fighters in there. Uh huh. ASAP. Yeah. They just there, there like, has to be something. Like put it as a legends deal, like how WWE does. Except yeah, sure. you have to become a referee. Like, sure. That's, that has to be the only way you can do this because this fight was close right up to the very end. Israel Adesanya was putting on a performance early. I mean, I still had it 4-1. I just didn't have it 10-8. You know See, what I, I mean? I, like, had it, I had it 3-2. Oh, okay. To be honest. But what you give him, the first and the fourth? I gave, no, I gave, I gave him the first and the third. First and third. Yeah, right. I gave him first and third. But I thought what Blahovitz did, he was to- not toying with him, but he was so patient in that beginning of the fight. That he was letting Adesanya land strikes and get some confidence. I was more shocked that he didn't start grappling until the third round. Well, um, like Dana said, you know, in the post fight presser, which I mean is probably true, is when you got guys of that skill level, that elite, as I mean, and right now Jan is. Yeah. Um, and obviously Adesanya is, that it's almost a, a factor of um trying to take advantage of of miscues. Mm-hmm. You know, you you dissect the opponent instead of trying to implement your game plan. Um, you know, so like Dana talked about the fact that these guys were just trying not to make mistakes. So that's why the earlier rounds were just, you know, one strike, get away, one strike, get away. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I thought Adesanya was uh, c- controlling the octagon, was able to push, uh, you know, Jan up against the cage. It And I also, I thought Jan was going to come out early and wrestle. Yeah, I thought that would have been the first route that he took, but... I think that once he took the first punch, which um, Adesanya did land a pretty good uh, right, and he felt the power, he was like, I ain't worried. Yeah, yeah This ain't going to knock me out. So I think he was like, I'm going to try and stay this on my feet, and then I'm going to surprise him later in the round and win some rounds by getting him on the ground late. Yeah, I agree. Pat? No, yeah, it was a good fight overall. I don't think it was necessarily as far apart score wise as the judges let you be led you to believe. Do I think it was a, you know, close one point differential between the two? No. But I think it was a little closer than what the refs like to say. Obviously beyond emerge victorious, you know, at least for me. But you know, the the judging was got awful atrocious and, and, and it's like you said before, and you and I have said before, don't leave it up to the judges when it comes down to the decision because Lord knows you don't know what they're going to do. And they have such a love affair with takedowns. Uh-huh. I, I just don't get it. Such good shit. I think it's just the takedown just shows control. It shows uh, you d- a dominance over your opponent for you to be able to have the ability to get him down. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, to me, when Jan got him on the ground, he was landing signif- significant blows. Like, he had him in position to strike. Right, and there's about a 30-pound difference, yeah, too. Which, yeah, I mean, that's huge So, But I think there's a difference between that and, like, maybe the earlier uh, part of the Dober fight mm-hmm. when uh, uh, Islam got him down and kind of didn't do much early when he got him down. Yeah. You know, Dober was able to get out early. But to the refs, you know, oh, my God, that's a takedown. It's different when a guy gets him down and is able to work blows, work shots, work positions. Like, that to me, is a, that's a takedown. You know what I mean? Not just the, I took him down for the sake of taking him down, now I'm laying and praying. Yeah. Is something that Blahovitz, I mean, kudos to him for doing. I Granted, though, I don't think those last rounds were 10-8s by any stretch of the imagination. Hell no. No. So, I mean, like I said, I had the score 3-2. Blahovitz. I had 4 1. But, but 4 1 is not anything to sneeze at because Adesanya for coming up and not clearing the 205 mark. Fuck. Which is insane to me, but you know what? He he went out there, he tried it's, doing it with his skill. I mean, I, I don't. 
I don't fault him as much for Neither the loss with this. It's just it's a gutsy move by him, but he had that much faith in his skills, and he is one of the last true martial artists in MMA. Here's here's my problem with the jump. When you did it in kickboxing, you went from middleweight to light heavyweight to heavyweight. That's kickboxing. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like your 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 uh, torque and your ability to generate power, you know, from your limbs is a lot different when you are six foot four um, fighting maybe a heavyweight in kickboxing who's five nine but weighs two twenty five. You know, like it. And then when you get in this octagon and you have a guy who weighs two thirty five, and now you're mixing in wrestling, your Muay Thai, you know, jujitsu, like. The ability for John to use his strength mm-hmm. comes into it and p- plays a factor. And I just, I mean, I hope, honestly, uh, no 185ers jump up to 205 anymore. Because it's just the, the, the vision in itself is too big for a guy who is a legit 185 to move up to anymore. The only guy I think that could, even though I will say after his last fight, I don't really want to see him fight again anyway, is Paulo Costa. And Costa he just came to my mind too, but he has a frame for it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I understand why Adesanya didn't want to put on that much weight because that is not his. You know, it's not his game. Like it would have slowed him down. He wouldn't mm. have had the same uh, mobility and agility that he has when he's fighting at 185. So for him to climb up to 225, it would have been bulky and just not good for him overall. You know what I mean? Yeah. But anybody else, you know, it just you can't fight a guy who's coming in at 235 and be 204. Yeah, and I think it was it was going to be an uphill battle for him. Though yeah. high stakes, high reward. I, hey, kudos. Yeah, like I, yeah. I mean, I don't want. I'm not sitting here disrespecting him because he went like they said. He went for greatness, and he got you know he lost. But yeah. like, good for him for doing it. You know, I just think that if you're going to make the jump from 205 to 225, you have to be 205. Yeah, you got, and you then you can go up. Yeah, it's a tough challenge to do, but obviously he wanted to prove that he could do it. So he did that fight with John Jones, that's now off the table. Yep, He's, even John has said, no, oh, that's probably not going to happen. Well, now. UFC yeah. dropped the ball. Yeah, which they, they should have just made that fight with John regardless. Well, I think they really want to see if he was going to be able to do it because obviously he is running the middleweight division right now. Right. Well, and John only wanted to do it if it was for a belt. Yeah. He wasn't going to just do it to do it. He wasn't going to do it just to do it. He's got that uh, winner of Miosic and Nganu from March 27th to look forward to, allegedly. He has, still hasn't signed on the dotted line for it, to my knowledge. But he's going to have to kind of sit back and wait to see. Adesanya, we don't know what his future is going to be. Obviously, he's going back to middleweight. But who does he fight? The winner of Whitaker and Costa? That's I what. Mean, no, it was somebody else's fighting too. Oh, Kenyane? Yeah, Kenyane would be a good one if I'm. If I'm no, there is. It's it's not. It's the winner of Rockhold versus somebody else. Hmm. That's that's what they were saying. That that be the that would be the number one contender. Yeah. Whitaker and Costa would basically just face the loser of that fight. I mean, that would be something, too. I mean, they're going to have a little bit of flux going on with that. So it's like... Well, it's... I mean, he's probably not going to fight. I mean, what's we're in March, and he they fought they fought in March, right? So yeah. he probably won't fight again till September. Uh, I mean, maybe, I would say maybe July. Maybe. Yeah. But, I mean, that's International Fight Week. I don't know. It, it's going to be tough to say because especially if they want to get in front of a crowd, I know they're really eyeballing getting to Texas right away. To, but that's for, not happening. Yeah. It's, Dana, it's, it's, <laughs> I don't know if you heard the post-fight conference, but like Dana was like, I've called Dallas. I've called San Antonio. They all said no. Yeah, so for now. But things could change in a heartbeat. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah no, I agree. They're saying he was like he was ready to move. Oh, yeah, he's ready to go 27. Now. He was ready to move the next card. Yeah. And they said no. So, I, I don't know. To me, I, yeah, Adesanya moved back to 185, stay in that division, stay, you know, not necessarily stay in your lane, quote unquote. But I just, to me, if guys are going to move up, it's got to be 10 pound jump only. Oh, I agree. So, like, you know, middleweight are, uh, what is it? Uh, well, Walter, not Walter Waits. What's the. Well, Walter Waits 170, middleweight. Yeah, well, Walter Waits. So, Walter Waits to middleweight, you could do. Um, you know, obviously Connor has shown that he can fluctuate between the three. So I think those three division, the lower end divisions can, it can probably go back and forth because those guys at 155 and 145 make huge cuts. 
to get down there. So that makes sense for them to go up to 170. But anything more, and you're just you're getting out of hand. I wouldn't doubt some people from light heavyweight coming down to fight him. To be honest with you, I yeah, think, I, I, well, I, could I mean, see that. listen, I uh, I watched uh, the Bisbing uh, Tito Ortiz Shamrock. That was the one that I was just watching. I didn't realize Bisbing started as a light heavyweight. Yeah. So I mean, it's very. I think it's very easy for those guys to come down. Yeah, he was actually undefeated till he faced Rashad Evans, and yep. then he went down, and then he went down. Yeah. I mean, it, it's crazy to think of. But sign he's got options. It's not like he's going to be out of the ring for that long. No. He'll bounce back very, very quickly. Blahovitz has got Glover Teixeira lined up. What, you're fucking nuts. Think about that real quick, man. Mm-hmm. Glover Teixeira, who was kind of just like the journeyman of the light heavyweight division, yeah. has you know been around, been around, been around, and fought his way into a title shot. Yeah, he's on like a four-fight win streak, something insane like that. But that over also, 40. and he made weight for Saturday, so he was ready to go. Yeah. Um, but I think that just goes to show, though, the the status of the light heavyweight division. Yeah. Which is nuts that a guy who was an afterthought in the division for so long is your number one contender. Yeah, and I already say this. I don't want to see Rackett fight for the title. I know he fought Santos on the uh, – I don't even want to get into that fight. Fuck. He is arguably that was one of the most so boring fighters bad. I think I've seen. Oh, my God. I was watch, I was waiting for Santos just to open up and let those hands go. I mean, how do you have a tattoo of a fucking hammer on your chest and throw lollipop shots like that? The disrespect of hammer tattoos. Yeah, like it, oh. it was just like I don't even like I said I don't even want to cover that. I, I mean, was so I, disappointed. In that fuck, fight. I'm gonna go into it because I was pissed. I mean, for him to and I understand the ACL surgery and the the injury that he had after the fight with John, but like, dude, and Rocket, what? Ugh, Rocket was boring. Boring, just yeah. terrible. Yeah, it was just score to score. Yeah, him and Blahovitz will will not be a good fight if that happens. No, it won't because if once Blahovitz kicks into gear, yeah, he'll just kick his ribbon. Hopefully. <laughs> A lot of headlines coming out of UFC 259, but definitely hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. What was your thoughts about the big fight night in Vegas? Let's discuss. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. In the not-too-distant future, following the rapid succession of World Wars 3 and 4, plus the hidden horrors of secret World War 2, there's not much left. All that remains is a place where folks get together to read and discuss comic books. Sometimes they laugh, sometimes they argue, but they always record and upload their transmissions. You've found one of those transmissions today. Welcome to The Last Comic Shop. Rate, review, and subscribe to our weekly comic book reviews on all the major podcasting platforms at www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and time to talk some wrestling. Wrestling. No. No? (laughs) (laughs) I won't do it because I will not give them that satisfaction of hearing that. Go right. ahead, tell, tell them what we're talking about. Fair enough, Pad. Uh, we were talking about AEW Revolution, which took place on Sunday at Daly's, uh, Daly's Place in Jacksonville, Florida. Or did you mean AEW Botchamania? Uh, that's an early contender for the, the actual name of it. Oh, is it, though? Because I bet you it'd get five stars. Oh, well, how you give it five stars? I'm it's coming crazy. out hot, motherfuckers, so if you AEW fans might not like me right now, I'm holding my seat. I'm getting so upset. So normally we break, down, we break down the card and what we thought. I'll be honest. I didn't watch the, watch the show uh, because I really don't watch AEW or care for it all that much. Uh, I know Ken did. Uh, but if you want his reactions to everything, go watch the uh, Twitch live stream back. Uh, but I'll run the results real quick. Uh, Britt Baker teamed up with Mackie Ido uh, because Britt's original. I know from uh, what Britt Reba was injured. Was injured. So they defeated Riho and uh, Thunder Rosa. Let's face it. If there's anything good that's come out of this card that is an absolute dumpster fire, it's Maggie Ido appearing on BTE with meeting the Dark Order and going surprise motherfuckers while sticking up middle fingers, Stone Cold Steve Austin style. Yeah, she's great. If if you haven't seen her, she is amazing. That was the first clip I've ever seen of her, and I was like, holy shit, this is hilarious. 
hilarious. Yeah, she was great for the... Like, this shouldn't have been on the pre-show. This should have been on the main show, in my opinion. But so, I understand why yeah. we were on the pre-show. Uh, and then you had Matt Jackson and Nick Jackson defeat Chris Jericho and MJF to retain the AEW Tag Team Championships. Uh, Pac and Ray Phoenix won the Casino Tag Team Battle Royale. Hikaru Shida uh, defeated Rio to retain uh, the AEW Women's Championship. Kip Sabian and Miro defeated Chuck Taylor and Orange Cassidy. Adam Page defeated Matt Hardy in a money match. Scorpio Sky defeated Cody Rhodes, Ethan Page, Lance Archer, Max Caster, and uh, uh, Panta L Zero uh, in a six-way ladder match. Darby Allen. What and- was the prize though for that? The prize. Yeah. Was a brass ring. Free rent. It was a Sonic Golden Ring. It was, Free rent. Yeah, it was a Sonic Golden Ring for a TNT Championship match, which I believe right. they well, announced. Didn't was it, it's wasn't taking it place more tonight? Of a on brass Wednesday's ring, record. though. It looked like a Sonic ring. To me. It, it looked. It was supposed to be a brass. It right. looked like brass ring to me. And what's that old saying Vince had? Oh, right. Free rent. Yeah. 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 Uh, so then you had the uh, street fight tag match between Darby Allen and Sting, who defeated Brian Cage and Ricky Starks, but. When we get to the match we're here to talk about, or one of the moments we're here to talk about, that was the exploding barbed wire death match for the AEW championship between champion Kenny Omega and challenger John Moxley, formerly known as Dean Ambrose, formerly known as, you probably had some other names, I don't know, yeah. uh, and the absolute dumpster fire that was the ending, uh, Ken. So let's break this down, shall we? Kenny Omega has been on this whole forbidden door deal. He's been going in, into Impact Wrestling. In fact, they've just announced that they're going to he's going to be facing their champion in a title for title match coming up uh, in a show in the near future. Yep. He's been really hyping up about how he wants to establish himself in the year of, year of Omega, as Coach Duffy has called to, uh, just being the best bout machine that he originally was when he came to AEW. And obviously his course to get to where he is now since he's arrived in AEW has been a little bit... Uh, Lackluster. Thank you. To put it mildly. So, Not landed. So this, Oh, sorry. No, I, no, no, you're... You, <laughs> Just keep burying, just uh, digging that hole. Oh, yeah. Uh, why do you have John Cena's golden shovel? Yeah. Yes. He, obviously, until he got his title shot, he's just been I'm just trying there. to hold down young talent. Yeah. And- All the young talent in AEW. I'm just trying to hold them down. Oh, my God. Coach is going in. But for this match, it was built up against John Moxley, and they have been hyping up that they wanted to do this exploding barbed wire death match. Now, if you're not familiar with this, I just suggest going on the Internet and searching out Onita. Uh-huh. You'll find good exploding barbed wire death matches. Mm-hmm. If you want to find some bad ones, trust me, you will find them. Uh, I believe Terry Funk standing in the middle ring when sparklers are going off and just shrugging, going, what? I saw one on the Squared Circle subreddit today where uh, Io Shirai was in one. I don't know when. It was before her WWE days. Io Shirai was in one, but the, the exploding barbed wire was on a baseball bat. And there's a, the shot, if you if you dig it up on Squared Circle subreddit, uh, is of her taking it in Somebody send this to Kenny Omega and John Moxley. That's what this shit should have looked like. Listen, and she got legitimately burned because she was wearing friggin' uh, what is it like? Um, I'm blank, like medical tape or yeah, some nonsense on her leg. Burn for, tape, yeah. Burn tape for weeks afterwards. Here, here's the gimmick, and I'm gonna give everybody in a little post production. Post production, you could have easily have filmed this match ahead of the show, ahead God, of the yeah. card. And, and fucking hired fucking, Michael Bay for it. And f- yeah, figured out the kinks and made this look like a million bucks. Uh-huh. But your desire and need to be like, oh, no, we, we're doing, you know, a la WCW. No, we're live, baby. We're doing this live. You had every way you could have taken advantage of the system and post-production edited this. And, oh, shit, the explosion came out bad. Rewire it and let's do it again. Mm-hmm. And instead, you opted to just go in there willy nilly and say, eh, "Let's let it ride." That's on you, especially when you are on TNT, which is a uh, you know a Warner Brothers company, a Warner Media company. Uh, there's some rather good production companies uh, under the banner of Warner Media and Warner Brothers Films that are very talented and very gifted at what they do. Not necessarily Lucas uh, Lucas uh, Arts or. Uh, ILM, that's what I'm trying to think of. Industrial Light Magic, not exactly ILM level, but they're pretty damn good at what they do. I agree with Coach. You should. Now, would it have been weird to have back-to-back uh, cinematic. cinematic matches? Yeah, but Christ, you could have, or even taped it ahead of time. Like Coach said, you would have figured out this shit because clearly they didn't know what they were I doing. I mean, you didn't even need to make it cinematic. You could have just, all right, had the match lay out the way that John and, and Omega wanted to do the match. Mm-hmm. Let that go. But then, 
when you have your moment here of you know trying to turn uh, what's his face. Uh, to a baby face, mm-hmm. who was the one who made the save? Oh, okay, Eddie Kingston. Eddie Kingston. Yeah, uh, Kingston. You know, you have, and obviously he's come out very sympathetic post. You know, the John Huber uh, video memorial mm-hmm. where he gave the locker room speech. Uh, you know, all of the video, the viral videos that he's had come out where you know he's essentially been making face promos, and now you have your big opportunity where now he's coming out and making the save of a of a uh, handcuffed. John Moxley, who is a bloody pulp in the center of the ring and can't save himself while the countdown's going on in the background. And you could have easily just said, cut, all right, let's queue up you know, the, the pyro and see what it looks like. Or just queued up enough pyro and enough smoke to then cut to said taped footage right and so it didn't need to be you know cinematic it could still been a match but you just you post produce the the thing and now you know you have this epic moment of you know eddie kingston coming out and saving your fallen hero and boom because start because as much as people you know shit on wwe these days and how bad it is there wwe's pulled that off effectively where live match taped bit back to live Pretty effectively. I mean, the one that comes to mind for me is some of the stuff with a couple of years ago with Braun versus Roman, mm-hmm. where they're fighting backstage and they're going through the motions, and then it cuts. Now there was the one instance where it was pretty blatant cut, but there have been other instances where they were going up against each other. That's like, oh wait a minute, I don't think this is live. I think this is taped. Yeah, this whole match unfortunately was ruined because it was actually a really good match. Sure, but as I believe Vince McMahon actually put, so I'm looking at the quote. Nobody cares about the match. Everybody just remembers the finish. So yeah, Bull, Bully Ray, Bubba Ray tweeted it out. Quote, the only thing they remember is the finish. Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Exactly. And that's why this, unfortunately, was the cherry on a bad Sunday. I mean, you even you even had the likes of uh, Booker T coming out today on his radio show saying, you know, he, he wasn't impressed. Uh, he went to say, quote, it was a bomb. It bombed miserably in front of the world. Don't put yourself in a situation like that ever again. And to blame it on Kenny Omega, Kenny Omega's a tech guy now. Uh, He went on to say, I'm just wondering who was the tech guy? Who put that thing together? Because the ending and the finale, it was comical. It was comical in the sense of, what was that? Are you kidding me? And then to cover it up by saying, Kenny Omega, he built this thing. Come on here. It's going to definitely definitely be one of those things where they're going to have to work themselves up out of that. Figure out how to get past that and move forward because it's something people are going to be thinking about for a long time, close quote. Exactly. The fact that they have now been throwing every single kind of excuse to see what sticks. Blocking the uh, TDE from or uh, Alito Bullet, whatever his Twitter handle is right now, blocking him from reposting the GIF. As Nick Jackson and Matt Jackson were like, "Oh, we'll never cease and desist anybody. We're not. We're yeah. not about that." Well, well the, until you're embarrassed. And the bullshit quote Tony Khan gave afterwards. I'm sorry. This is the weakest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. So he spoke. He a couple of days ago spoke uh, about the ending of uh, the pay per view event. Uh, quote during a post that I'm reading from a four fwonline.com's article. Quote, during a Revolution post-show media scrum, Khan explained that the reason the show ending explosion was weak was because in storyline, Kenny Omega failed to deliver on his promise of an exploding ring, saying, quote, I think we're all lucky that the bomb going off at the end didn't really hurt anybody. Kenny's big master plan, he built a dud. What would, uh, who would have thought when he drew the big plan with crayons that maybe the bomb might not fail to take both guys out? But at the end, I don't know what people really wanted unless you wanted us to actually explode the guys at the end. There's only so much you can do, Khan later added. So without actually blowing the ring up, blowing both guys up, I think the basic explanation is Kenny's ring was set to explode and his plans as a heel who built this thing with a hammer and nails, as we saw, the final bomb just didn't go off, close quote. Then please explain to me why Eddie Kingston lied on top of John Moxley like they died. If it to well, quote, to quote a couple for people, minutes to, after and to quote a oh, couple people minutes after yeah. oh yeah and to quote a couple people on Reddit if you're gonna call something a death match somebody better goddamn fucking die no I don't mean literally <laughs> yeah. but in storyline <laughs> well I mean to me it's just you know the announcers selling it the way that they did you know Kingston laying there you know it's just it it could have you could have done that yeah they could have very easily have. Kenny Omega just doesn't know how to plant a bomb, apparently. And it doesn't help that 
you're uh, that Moxley comes out and you know say what you will differing opinions might not be friends at the end of the day as a company they should still have each other's backs and not bury the other talent at least in public on fucking social media right. i mean to have happening. to have moxley come out and say after the show quote kenny omega may be a tough son of a bitch but he can't make an exploding ring worth a shit i've seen more dangerous shit on ridiculousness on mtv what the fuck was that well i know he tried saying that in storyline yeah so he should they, they're not publicly pointing the fingers at each other right in but real just, life but to even but, to even say that but but well he's just trying to save face with it because they all knew that this was a dud they've got pie in their face yeah big time. but the fact that everybody's passing the blame that's the thing that's really frustrating. That okay, we have said time and time again about AEW that you need to have one clear common voice and that should be the one speaking. Mm-hmm. Facts. You have multiple people talking multiple answers for and the shitstorm. Yeah, and and various degrees of storyline around those shitstorms. And you could have even yeah. you could have even gimmicked the ring so that fireworks goes off, obscures the vision. Lord knows WWE's done it over the years where you can't see the ring because of pyro and, and fireworks or whatever. And gimmick the ring so that they have a spot, you know, Kingston goes in for the save and they disappear. And all of a sudden you get to the end of the show going, Holy shit, wait, where'd they go? And then you have them show up on Dynamite on Wednesday, you know crutch bandages all over the place like oh my god you know you won't believe what the hell just happened to us that's fucking post-production yeah that's literally what this boils down to i mean you saw it in the uh kevin owens roman match with the handcuff Mm -hmm. that was a uh you know a wwe not thinking on their feet saying all right we need to post-product this This, produce this this absolutely needed to be pre-taped because i while like i said while i wasn't watching the show I was watching Walking Dead, and I was just checking Twitter and commercial breaks, and I saw some of the wrestling accounts I follow were sharing stuff from people who were at the Daily's place, and they were sending out pictures of them setting this shit up while the cinematic match with Sting was going on. Yeah. You cannot test this, take something down, and then set it up again and expect it to do the same thing. You just can't. What they should have done is held this at the Jacksonville Football Stadium Empty arena. I understand that the people that paid to watch the show would not have seen two matches, but if you're going to try doing something like this, you had an idea something was going to be off because when that counter was going off, the talent that was in the front row was not exactly running for cover at a very Mm -hmm. far distance, from my opinion. Uh And like I say... There has been so much negative backlash, and rightfully so, oh, for yeah. how this was handled. Oh, yeah. Like I said, everybody's passing the blame. They're not going after each other in real life. They're going after each other in character. But the fact that there is no clear, we screwed up, we're sorry. The fact that every day there's a new excuse for it and, and more petty reaction to and it. And more fucking just, just AEW marks. Yeah. Just... A brushing cult. it, brushing it under the rug. That let's face with it, with a broad brush. Yeah, yes. brushing it under the rug with a broad brush. That let's face it, shoes on the other foot. You would not hear You'd the end of this. They would crucify WWE, killing, uh-huh. killing WWE. Oh my god, and you, you wouldn't be able to hear the end of it. You wouldn't. And you know, to me, it's just that's what I mean. I after this, and the you know, obviously the Twitter beef that I went through uh, on Monday or Tuesday, whatever day it was. Yeah, it was I'm I'm completely turned off to the AEW group now. I'm I'm done. I I honestly I won't I won't watch it. I won't check it out anymore. I'm completely turned off. If you can't sit here and admit your faults, and now you talk about the fact that which we haven't talked about at all, you sign Christian yes. Cage. Oh yeah. Um. And you want to sit here and act like that's a major acquisition, which, hey, I'm happy for Cage. You know, uh, he, I, I, you know, whenever a guy can make a comeback after a career ending injury, you know, when his career was taken to him from, you know, taken short, uh, I'm always, you know, happy for them. You know, Daniel Bryan, you know, all of those guys, like they work their tail off. They love this business. And for them to have an injury stop them sucks. So when these guys get to make a comeback, I'm nothing but happy for him. So good for him. But when you sit here and you build this as a major acquisition. Uh, to the point where people are going, mentioning Brock Lesnar, yeah. John Cena, CM They Punk. overhype this yeah. completely. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, and then you deliver. They WandaVisioned it. Yeah, and then you deliver mm-hmm. this, and then you try to to sell this as, you know, uh, a big deal because he's going to be a presence in the locker room and stuff. But you're, you're, 
you're a company of the youth. You you yeah. were supposed to be the difference between the uh, the John Cena's ruling the WWE with an iron fist for the last 25 or 20 years. You know, the, the Hunter Hearst Helmsley's still getting WrestleMania matches. The Undertaker's coming in. You know, all these part-timers. And now you have Paul White, who is on the back half of his career. Yeah, you back, have cru- back quarter. Back, yeah, you have Christian Cage coming back, yeah, who years hasn't old. wrestled in the last five years. You have Jericho, you have Moxley, who's 50, you have Jack 40, Hager, you have uh, Sting, who's 60. Sting. 61. So, you know, we continue to name these guys and, and, and age them, but there's two common denominators that they have here. They're all ex-WWE guys, and they're all past their prime. Yeah, so it, tell me again how you motherfuckers are the youth movement of wrestling. Because if I want to watch the youth movement of wrestling, I got to catch it on YouTube on Monday nights. And guess what I'm not doing? Turning on YouTube on Monday nights so I can watch AEW Dynamite Zone or whatever the hell they're going to call it. No thanks. Yeah. Pass. I'd rather watch uh, a rerun of ROH before I check that out. Don't get me wrong. It, it's good to see Christian come back. Anytime a guy can come back from injuries or whatever, like Coach said, you know, Edge, Daniel Bryan, you know, name your, a wrestler who's come back from an injury, had another run, is great. But as somebody who didn't watch him, who hasn't seen him, I couldn't give any less of a fuck that he came back. It doesn't move the needle for me. You know, now maybe that's because I didn't get to see him and I don't have that nostalgia, so I'm not looking at it with rose-colored glasses. But honestly, I don't give a fuck that he's back. Is it great for them behind the scenes? Yes, I agree 100% with what Bully Ray said on Twitter, that you should have weekly psychology classes with him teaching and getting the younger guys in there and giving them a one-on-one because I would agree with him that he's one of the best psychological minds in, in wrestling history. Yeah, You know, I haven't seen everything, though. I've seen a couple matches, but... He's absolutely great to have behind the scenes. Do I think he needs to be on in the ring at 47 years old in an active role? Is he supposedly going to be? No. Occasional match? Yeah, maybe. Sure. On-screen storyline purposes? Yeah, sure. But it's not moving the needle for me. I This doesn't move the needle for me to go, ooh, Christian's on... On AEW Dynamite. Paul White, the Big Show's on AEW Dynamite. I gotta watch AEW Dynamite now. I don't give a fuck. I've never cared about Big Show. All outside of maybe a funny match or segment he's in. And in the running joke that he changes heel face every five seconds. Yeah. I don't care that Edge is back. Was it cool to see him at the Royal Rumble? Yeah, but that's because I never really got to see him live in a, in a match before. It was all, you know, stuff on the network. You know... Do I care Sting's back? It, it's great to see him in the ring again when I thought, you know, his career was over and done with. But it's not moving the needle for me. It's not making me go, I got to turn on AEW on Wednesday nights. I'd rather sit at home and play and play video games or watch a movie. I live tweet AEW every Wednesday night. And every time I think they take a step forward, they take two steps back. I'd argue it's about six at this point. Well, this pay-per-view, I have seen multiple people say, what did I watch? And obviously... They've put it in a lot more broad strokes, as Coach likes to say. Uh, there was not a lot to really say this was a win. I really can't. I gave an official grade a C- minus on this, and I'm being generous because I thought some of the in-ring work definitely was worthwhile, like the tag match. The tag team battle royal was long, unnecessary uh, 20, with a lot of teams. 26 minutes and 45 seconds, according did, to ProFightDB.com. Did not need to be that long, but I do like the fact that the final competitors was Jungle Boy and Ray Phoenix, and you know the right team won and went over, in my opinion. So I'm not mad about that. I'm happy that Ethan Page got to make a mainstream debut, but it was overshadowed because Cody could not get off the fucking stage and had to nurse a shoulder injury and really take away from the spotlight on that. They, they were clearly in camera shot, searching for a brass ring, which they already know. Hey, congratulations, you get a TNT title shot on this week's Dynamite. What is the purpose of that? And if I heard that wrong, I will be the first one to say I was wrong about that. The whole show, in a nutshell, was bad. And there was not very few things to say it was good about. Like a C is an average grade, it was below average. I'm probably being very generous about that. Because I say, the in-ring work for some of the matches was very good. The street fight, the cinematic match, was the best 90s action film I've seen since The Crow. And I know somebody else pointed that out in the stream, so I'll give a shout-out to Rich and Diesel about that, or it might have been Tyler from 30 and Nerdy. Either way, this show had a lot to live up to, and it failed. And it didn't deliver. 
The only thing that's going to be worth watching Wednesday night is see, okay, where are we going to say now to try explaining this? I know I'll be checking it out, and I'll definitely have a lot to say on 607TWS this Thursday with Rich from 3FN, so definitely tune in to twitch.tv slash 607podcast for that. Drop a follow while you're there. But in the meantime, what was your take on AEW Revolution? Did you watch? And if you did, what did you think about it? And let's have an honest conversation about this. I don't want to be talking to people that are just completely blinded because it's AEW and you love that promotion. I watch the promotion. I support the promotion. I did not like this show, so let us have this discussion and see where we get. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Why can't he put you in the shark? Because you can't grapple a ghost. (laughs) Fucking obviously. He's a ghost. You can't grapple a ghost. It's cool. It's like, there's already a dead body involved. Exactly. Very full. Sometimes when you do some crime, people die, and it's okay. We're the Broken Lords. We provide the finest actual play rpg related nonsense this side of the internet follow us on twitter at lords broken and give us a listen on any major podcasting platform coming back for the final segment on this edition of the odph podcast pad you want to kick us off with those one shots or actually local minute yeah i I got some local minute first i gotta talk some binghamton devils hockey uh because this past weekend they played at two games uh saturday they took on the scranton wilkesburg penguins where they lost by the final score of six to three uh, and then Sunday, they took on the Hershey Bears and lost in overtime by the final score of 4-3. to three. Looking at their upcoming games, they have a game this Wednesday, March 10th, uh, 7 o'clock, taking on the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. Uh, Friday, they have a game against the Hershey Bears, game time 7 o'clock. Uh, and then Saturday, uh, March 13th, they have a game at 7.05 against the Lehigh Valley Phantoms. More information, BinghamtonDevils.com. And we have some Bing- Binghamton Bulldogs news. Some essentially breaking news. Yes. So, according to their Facebook page, this afternoon at 2 p.m., the Binghamton Bulldogs signed a seven-year lease to move into a uh, 13,000-square-foot space on 1025 Robinson Hill to create the the Bulldogs Sport Complex, making it the first ABA basketball team in history to have their very own branded facility. So, a lot is breaking about this, so I'm just going to tell you right now, go to Binghamton Bulldogs on Facebook or also BinghamtonBulldogs.com for more information. And if you're in the 607 area and going, wait, where's that? It's uh, up north of the mall. Yes. It's, Not far. Yeah, it's, it's very easy to find. So kudos to uh, Jimmy Evans and the team there with the Binghamton Bulldogs for making this happen. Uh, a lot of news breaking about this, so definitely stay tuned for that. We'll have a lot more to say about it next week. Yeah. So that being said, let us start the one shot, shall we? Yeah, I got a couple things to talk about. Uh, first, I'll start with the sports because, my God, this is a bad look. Uh, when baseball teams are in spring training, they practice a lot of things. Uh, pitchers covering first base immediately comes to mind. You know, ground outs, all, all the, you know, pop flies, you know, the stuff you usually think of. One thing I think a lot of teams don't practice, and I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, this is something they need to practice more. No, don't practice this because this is like, a bad, A, a bad look, and B, if you're into superstitions, you know, you might jinx yourself a little bit. Uh, but the New York Mets decided to that a little positive thinking might manifest their dreams in a World Series title. Because in the midst of doing some defensive drills, they thought it would be a good idea to practice what they would do if they won a championship. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, no, so... Uh, they were playing a simulated game, uh, and uh, reading from the ESPN article dot, uh, dot com, uh, it says, quote, with one out left in the game, uh, Tarasco set up a uh, Tony Tarasco, uh, one of the Mets coaches, uh, set up a situation where the Mets were in game seven of the world series needing one out to win. Uh, after a catch by outfielder, Michael Conforto, the team decided to celebrate as if it had just clinched a title. Uh, Mets manager Luis Rojas said, quote, I thought Michael did a good job of simulating the catching and running back in and everyone was celebrating. So fun times. It was probably, it was an exciting camp day. Probably the best I've seen that drill done in my young coaching career. Close quote. Uh, yeah, that's such a bad look. Why? I know teams. Have, Why? I know there's been a couple of teams in the past that have done it. They don't immediately come to mind, but I know teams have done this in the past. Spoiler alert. None of them have ever won the world series the same year they do it. So you're almost jinxing yourself yeah, you, to not win at this point. It's like touching the Calder Cup and then um, before you actually win the title in yeah, the Stanley yeah. Cup. Like it's superstitious in in, yeah. in, in, in sports. 
Yeah, d- d- bad wow. luck. I don't care what the train of thought is. Yeah, this is such a bad yeah. look. Uh, I got a couple comic recommendations for you this week. Uh, first of which is from Dark Horse. It is God of War: Fallen God, issue number one. Uh, this so this is going to tell a story that takes place between God of War three and the most recent God of War because there is a bit of time that passes in between that. Have read it uh, myself. Interested to see where it goes. Although if he's supposed to end up in the Norse area, he takes a bit of a wrong turn at Albuquerque. Uh, we'll see where it goes from here. But I did like what I see. I read. Uh, also, you have Star Wars issue number twelve uh, coming out this week, and then also. Uh, uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 61 and Christ Almighty after that last panel I cannot re- wait to read this and see where they go from this if y'all were wondering I'll just spoil 69 it's been out for like a month at this point uh, or two weeks at this point if y'all were wondering where Mephisto was in WandaVision it's not because he's in WandaVision it's because he's in Amazing Spider-Man yeah that last page is a crazy one to read uh-huh. all I'm going to say is Doctor Strange and Mephisto yeah <laughs> you got to read about it obviously that's a big issue coming out too. DC wise, Joker number one came out too. Yeah. So the regular series with the Clown Prince of Crime definitely lived up. I mean, it's got a lot of potential. What's going on with it too? I don't want to spoil too much on it. It definitely was a fun read. And I have to give a quick shout out to Valiant Comics. We are lucky enough. We just were added to the press list, so I got an early release of Bloodshot Twelve. Did an uh, Parlay Points blog about it. Great issue. I'll give you a kind of non spoiler about it. It is definitely a fun book to pick up i know bloodshot is going to take a little time off after this so definitely you want to jump in grab this issue pick up some back issues and definitely go go support everything valiant's doing they're amazing people too so definitely want to throw that plug in speaking of comics coach uh superman lois aired uh last night as it's a regular scheduled time and place uh and with another fantastic episode i really i tweeted out that we don't deserve this show Uh, (laughs) and i stand by that notion i mean uh, we've been gifted an opportunity to have a tremendous Superman show done correctly, and I think it was great. A uh, little overview of the episode real quick. Uh, the boys are now playing football together, uh, which was uh, a shock to Clark, uh, as also the boys found out that uh, Daddy has been listening in on them at school uh, for a long time, which they were not too fond of finding out. Uh, eventually, uh, Clark and the boys came to a conclusion that, uh, that he will no longer do it. And, uh, it ended, you know, nicely with, uh, the, both them getting ready to go out on the football field. Uh, in Lois's news, uh, she is, uh, pushing, uh, Morgan Edge's buttons here as they now sent a pretty powerful person after, uh, a mother who had stepped forward with some potential, uh, news regarding Morgan Edge's other towns that he has disrupted. And uh, Superman had a hell of a time in a pretty sick battle uh, yeah. in, a ho- in a hotel room uh, with this uh, meta human, I guess we can call. Yeah. <laughs> Unna- unnamed individual. Yeah, yeah unnamed the, individual. Closest I got was something uh, along the lines of subject. 11 yeah uh, word is paul white's interested in signing him for AEW. <laughs> <laughs> so uh no john laronitis is interested in signing for wwe now oh that's true uh, oh, Lord yeah. Itis. so uh it was a very good episode though overall uh really excited for the next preview as it looks like sam lane's coming back in the picture oh, um yeah. causing some mischief in the family by calling out superman it's good it's super tur- dad it's turning into a race for me between him and lana's husband who i'm gonna hate more yeah it's because i saw close. the preview and i'm like i'm starting to hate you a little bit more yeah no this show definitely had a lot going on with it it didn't have so much to deal with superman per se just no. more of the family aspect right love seeing uh, run the jewels had a song getting played during the Football yeah, I saw that. Yep. Marked out about that. I, I, but I'm also on the theory that I saw on Reddit that the boys, when they are together, have their power. Mm. When they are separate, they are weaker. Could be. Interesting. That's Could what be. I'm on right now. I really, because, I mean, Jordan, obviously, uh, until Jonathan showed up, wasn't really able to do anything. Then all of a sudden, Jonathan comes back. Pow, you know, uh, powers light up uh, on the football field. You know, all of a sudden, Jordan's knocking everybody around and and you know hitting guys fifteen or fifteen yards back, oh, Christ, yeah. Yeah. crushing people playing inside linebacker corner. Which I, that just goes to show maybe Jordan's lack of knowledge for football because they told him to go play corner and then all of a sudden I line, I saw him lining up in between a defensive end and a defensive tackle and I'm like, you're playing you're playing linebacker, my dude. You did not listen to your coach. But uh, pretty pretty good episode though. Yeah. One point two five uh, for the ratings. 
Nice. It's good to see that show is definitely getting the ratings in. I know when it first came out, a lot of people were kind of skeptical of what we were going to get. Right. But this show has delivered on everything. I mean, Tyler Holkin has been amazing. Ten yes. pounds. Ten yeah. pounds. Ten yeah. pounds. Ten pounds. Ten pounds. I, in that scene, too, when he was in that fight scene, though, I'm sta- when he was doing the big, like, uh, coming puff back up. up, puff up from the ground, I'm like, God damn it. Yeah. God damn it. Just, just, just. Get in the weight room, my dude, and just put on the ten pounds. The suit looks so puffy. It look. I mean, I'm sorry. Just the suit. The overall suit looks great. Yeah. But when he puffs up, and you can just tell yeah. that it is that much padded, I'm like, ah, killing me. It, it definitely is something I'm noticeable. With yeah, no, it's it, so it, it's so bad. It's it, noticeable. But yeah, it's bad. But you know, like I just. I don't get so focused in on it. I know, I'm, I'm, but but you're the Superman guy of the group. I'm, I, so. Listen, I'm a uh, you, you know, like John Laronitis. I'm a body guy. You know, yeah. I just notice the body compositions. I want the six foot six guys, not the guys who can work in the ring. When I'm talking about Superman, no, and, and I mean that's fair too. And, I guess it's the damn toys. You know what? It's the damn toys in the '90s that we grew up with with Superman having these ginormous arms and big chest that makes me that stuck out in my head you know it wasn't just superman that was everything well, yeah, sure yeah, but yeah, i mean yeah. i've had a lot of superman toys though like look at the superman cartoon the guy's oh, oh, chest yeah. was like a oh, fucking box i mean man. i saw i saw one the other day where it was like a lando calrissian action figure from like the 80s early 90s compared to what it is now and i'm like i'm like uh i, I respect the hell a hell out of billy d williams but he wishes his biceps but looked that, that big. i love the delivery though when lois was like uh, you know, the guy's like, that's not going to... I was waiting because I was like, Lois, Clark, call Clark, call Clark. Like, you're going to need him. And then, you know, she pulls out the little radio device and he's like, that's not going to help you. And he's like, I, she's like, I know, but he will. And boom, he yeah. shows up. I was like, oh, let's go. Yeah. That was sick. Every time Superman makes an entrance too. Oh, fuck yeah. Like, they nail that. Yeah. That's one thing that I think it falls under the radar a lot. When he shows up... It is exactly how it should be. Yeah, very uh, big. Yeah, very presentable. Huge. Gravitas. Like, yeah. yeah. It's not just he flies in nonchalant. It's like when he shows up, you know the stakes are high. Yep. I love how they're pacing with it. Yeah, like, I, I mean, even when he showed up at the school when Jordan was pinned up uh, 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 against a there. locker by Sean, yeah. um, I loved that scene um, because like he just shows up he's just, <laughs> the whole way's really changed here. It just, you know, you felt that whole uh, wholesome you know, family esque uh, uh, Clark just being, you know, the goofy Clark. Yeah. You know, I thought that was great. Um, how the students didn't notice all of a sudden this guy standing there, though, with super speed was weird, but okay. It's comic. Yeah, yeah, you know, you guys hey, suspend that. Yeah, sp- sp- suspend disbelief. Uh, and also, though, the daughter, Lana Lane's daughter, cutting that promo in the middle of the diner. Two things as a dad, real quick. <laughs> I was expecting this. The, the, uh, Whatever you can say, you can say in front of them thing would not, it does not fly for me. Like, I would be like, oh no, I can't say what I need to say in front of people who aren't in our family. Get your ass up. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, because whenever they say that, first off, you know, like, you're going to deliver, like, you have something you need to tell her or your child, and, mm. you know, it's not something that should be said in the open. And then when she cut the promo back on Lana, Aaron and I were watching the show together because Aaron uh, had to run our daughter out to get. Uh, stuff for school photos and she came back in like right around that scene was happening and she like sat and watched it real quick and it was like we both look at each other like yo if that was ever one of our kids talking to us like that in public oh my god yeah. like it's not just a we need to go it's a i am grabbing you and i am dragging you out of this restaurant you ain't talking to me that way well the one thing you gotta remember too smallville is so but that's the yeah, yeah you like i mean literally lana it like is getting lambasted by her daughter of being a pill popper having a bad marriage being a bad mother and the, and the people behind her starting boom. to look at yeah, the watch. And like, everybody oh everybody in this restaurant's turning around and being like, oh shit, that's Lana Lang right there, and her daughter is talking some shit. Yeah, like, it, I, hell no. Weeks of cooler talk. Uh huh. I mean, that is all the tea. Yeah, and I think that's going to play into said. a factor later. Like I said, Smallville is just such a, a different place. Fuck, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, but yeah. that's but that's the exact reason why I would have. No, we oh, yeah, go yeah, because that's going everywhere now. Because well, you got to remember, yeah, it's small town USA, so thus. Everybody knows everything, and, and then the, and the and the, the 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 leaving and her bumping into Clark and her saying, "Not now, Ken." I was like, "That's 
Lana Lang. Like, that is the Lana from the movie that didn't want to give Clark the time of day because he was a, a dopey, you know, goofy, you know, loner. Yeah. Like, I was like, that's awesome because that was a definitely, that was that delivery, you know? Oh, yeah. No, it was great it, episode. It was, yeah, it was perfectly played. Like, it was just more family driven and just like the teenage angst, you know, going on with everybody. Like I said, Dude, they Sarah pack Cush. so much shit in an hour. Yeah, they do. And you know, I mean, and, the, and the good thing about it, too, is like they balance it very well. Right. Like it wasn't so much overdrawn on everybody. The only thing you could say maybe got neglected a little bit, and, and this is just, it's small, is how much time Superman was on screen and how they wrapped up the battle with Subject 11. Right, because he was gone. Because, yeah, yeah, he was gone, and but then obviously like, what happened in the end of the episode. But too, it was but. nice because it was like I said, I mean, but even the opening scene of showing Superman, I didn't expect because I was like, there's going to be episodes that we don't get Superman, but they still worked them in, and it fit, and it works. Yeah, it absolutely fit. It worked. It's been such a, a nice surprise. For what we were seeing out of the CW, that obviously has become a must uh, must watch show. We know that they're taking a break after uh, episode six. Yeah, thanks, Dre, for breaking my heart. <laughs> well, Shout well, out, Dre, well, driven. They're not taking a break. They have to finish filming. Yeah, that's the finish filming. <laughs> they so. had to they had to pause filming, so they're literally only I have only up to episode whatever the last one they have is finished. Yes. Six. Listen, six. I wasn't ready for that. I was ready for all how many episodes again? Twenty four or 20, 21? I think it's fifteen like to that. start. Fifteen. And then, then they're they're coming back for a full slate the next. I year. was ready for my fifteen episodes. I was I, Tuesday night at nine o'clock, baby. On my ass is on the couch, and now I have to wait after episode six. But at least we're going to get some Supergirl in between. Yeah, sure. For the final I'm season, just kidding. Yeah, no, for the, for the final season, final yeah. season, you know they're going to go full tilt for that. So we got some stuff to look forward to. Plus, when they return, I think they're going to pair with uh, Star Girl. So on Tuesday nights, that's going to be absolutely must watch. Can TV. we get Superman at eight though, so I can go to bed? <laughs> Please, maybe. CW, can you do that for me? Because I am tired. Because now I'm now I'm getting wired. I'm getting all fired up because of that. You know the fight scene, and I'm leaving, and I'm like. Well, let's go, and I'm getting all you know my adrenaline's going, and then I gotta try and go to bed, and that's not easy. We'll just have you put on AEW Revolution; it'll knock you right out. I up. won't even watch it. So, <laughs> no. But that being I'll said, I'll force myself to sleep. <laughs> Definitely make sure you're checking out Superman and Lois. Definitely interact with us too. We want to know your opinion of the show. Everything we've talked to from all our uh, content creating friends and and fans have everybody's been like really jazzed about the show. So. Uh, we're excited to talk about it each week, so definitely let us know what you think about this past week's episode. The Perks of Not Being a Wallflower. Love the title of this episode, too, by the way. Oh, that was the name of the episode? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. God damn. Just flawless. This show. God. We don't deserve you. No, we don't. We don't. But, man, I'm so glad we have it. That was going to be my one shot, too, so Coach and I teamed up on that. So let's just say the music you heard on this episode of the ODPH is that of Brian Wolf of Fair City Fire and Shout of the Robots. Both of those musicians, all of them are amazing people. And you should go support them in everything they're doing. Pad, where do you find out about that? OchoDuroParlayHour.com. Right on. You swing out over the music section. You can find out what Brian's doing in Fair City Fire. You can check out what Shadow the Robots is doing. Floodland, Second Suitor, Tom Jolu, Yard Party. All the great music you hear here on the ODPH. Also, while you're there, swing out over the directory where you can find Friends of the Show, Organizational Link Support, and Black Lives Matter. All the amazing pod groups we're in because, you know what, if you're not on Podchaser with your group, you're not in a pod group. Sorry, just putting that out there. So shout out to Pod Nation. Shout out to the Legion Independent Podcast. Shout out to Alternate Reality Radio and the massive pod lift every Tuesday. Shout out to Lit, Lit Gaming Arena, too, because they put it on every week. So if you are into podcasting, you want to find shows to check out. If you're not in the pod lift, you are failing miserably. But I know two groups that are definitely crushing that thing right now, and that's the Apocalypse and the Innered Circle. Everybody is killing it on Tuesday. So definitely you want to make sure you're interacting with that. And, of course, we got to shout out our guys over at 8122 Productions. Rich, Ron, hashtag Big Natty Cool, and, of course, Mike C. from Horror Zone 607. Check out what they're doing at 8122 Productions and especially what they're doing on Patreon, patreon.com slash 8122 Productions. Enough said there. You definitely want to be interacting with the ODPH during the week. You can find our Twitter handles all on at OD Parlay Hour. Check out the T Public Store. So much more is going on, man. It is crazy. So just stopping over at OchoDoorParlayHour.com. You won't be disappointed. That's all I got for this week. So for the one and only Padawan J. I'm going to hit you with this little stat at the end. Uh, Lonzo Ball has more three-pointers this year than Trey Young. <sighs> that is insane stat. Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, 99 three-pointers compared to Trey Young's 85. For your coach, my coach, the coach, Coach Duffy. I got nothing. Obi Toppin should have won the dunk contest. Facts. Ah! I'm your host, Ken M. 
It doesn't matter that Blake Griffin is in Brooklyn. Oh, shit. Yeah. All, yeah, all, that, that, all that matters is uh, Aaron Gordon got robbed in 2016. <laughs> exactly. That's facts. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time.